to the November 24th, 2020 meeting of the Arlington School Committee. This open meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020 due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus in order to mitigate the transmission of the virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings and as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will not feature public comment. For this meeting, the Arlington School Committee is convening by Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that others may be able to see you. Take care not to screen share your computer. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All the materials for this meeting, except any executive session materials are available on the Novus Agenda dashboard. We recommend the members and the public follow the agenda as posted on Novus, unless I note otherwise. Um, I will introduce each speaker uh, on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, I will go down the list of members, inviting each by name to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Please remember to mute your phone or computer, speak clearly in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. Uh, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you for any response, state your name before speaking, which we haven't been doing and will not be doing this evening. If members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair. Finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. So let me confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Um, Ms. Exton. Here. Mr. Cardin. Yes, here. Um, Dr. Allison Ampey. Here. Uh, Mr. Thielman. Here. Mr. Uh, Schlickman. Present. Mr. Hayner. Here. And I am also here. Um, I'm gonna start at the top. Our, uh, Dr. Bodie. Present. Dr. McNeil, I don't see yet. Um, now I'm going to start at the top. Uh, Mr. Spiegel. Here. Uh, Ms. Keyes. Here. Mr. Bowler. Here. Dr. Janger. Here. Mr. McCarthy. Here. Mr. Mason. Here. Ms. Elmer. Here. Great. Okay. Um, so I, I did want to make a comment just before we got started because I did receive um, some emails today questioning uh, or just you know curious about why there wasn't public comment scheduled for this meeting. This is a special meeting um, of the school committee that we scheduled a week ago, two weeks ago. I'm not sure. It's a bit of a blur at this point, but we had set this meeting with the intention of uh, giving it as a sort of a signpost in our superintendent search process. And initially the only item on the agenda for this evening was the superintendent search process. Um, after the, um, given that we absorbed our uh, Thursday regular school committee meeting that was last week um, with a superintendent interview, um, we were not able to meet as a full committee to discuss the Arlington, the plans for Arlington High School with Dr. Jinger and his team. Um, so we added that to the agenda for this evening, um, given that our next meeting because of the holiday is not until December 10th. Um, so typically in a special meeting, we don't always have public comment. Um, and it, had we just been addressing the superintendent candidates, um, I think that that would have made sense. But anyway, that's where we are. Um, so no public comment for this evening. Thank you to those who have um, sent you sent us your comments um, by email. Um, so the first item on the agenda is a vote on winter sports for Arlington High School. So uh, Mr. Bowler. Hi, uh, thank you for letting me speak tonight. Um, first, I wanna thank you for approving fall sports. Um, when you include practices and games, we had over 500 athletic events with 348 students participating this fall. Um, varsity teams met with their team and coaches four days a week, sub varsity with their coaches three days a week. Um, I couldn't see their smiles because everyone had masks on, but I, I could tell they were happy to be there and participating with their team and you know playing, playing the sports that they love. So uh, winter athletics is
Let's give him a minute. Doesn't look good though. Walter chair leading. Okay. Mr. Bowler, unfortunately, we lost you for a critical component of what you were saying. We got to the point where you told us that the kids were having a good time, and then you moved to winter and you froze. So if you could rewind, that would be great. So the, the MIA uh, moved uh, some traditional winter sports. Uh, indoor track has been moved to the fall two season, starting February 22nd. Wrestling has been moved to the spring season, starting April 25th and no winter cheerleading. Uh, winter cheerleading, usually they just cheered at, at um, athletic events and that is not allowed this year from the MIA. The Middlesex League has actually moved boys swimming to the fall two seasons starting February 22nd. Uh, most of the schools in the Middlesex League do not have pools right now and uh, the, the ones that do have limits to one person per lane with like five lanes in a pool. So um, moving, moving swimming uh, you know, to be able to uh, compete with a must for the Middlesex League. The Middlesex League has approved having boys and girls basketball, boys and girls hockey, gymnastics. And also we're, uh, this year we're new, we're in Ski East, so we have a ski team. The winter timeline right now is from starting 12-14, first practice for basketball, gymnastics, and hockey, with games starting um, after January 1st. Skiing is going to start January 5th. Um, we, we ski up at the Blue Hills in Canton. The last day of winter sports is 2-21. Um, we're going to continue to the same, um, same format as the fall, um, you know, varsity teams will play 10 games, uh, sub varsities will play eight to 10 games. Um, most games for basketball will be on Saturdays, um, holidays, a uh, couple, a couple week nights to get the 10 games in, in the shortened season, uh, and possibly February vacation. Hockey games will be, um, based on rink availability when we can play those games, uh, and they'll play 10 varsity games and, uh, eight to 10 sub varsity games. Uh, cheerleading, I mean, gymnastics will be on Saturdays and there'll be seven to eight meets depending on how many um, Middlesex League teams have gymnastics teams. We're gonna continue the practice limits. Varsity will practice three days a week and sub varsity will practice two days a week. Each student is expected to get to their practice and contest on their own. The school department will not be supplying transportation to any games. Uh, MIA has made sports specific guidelines, basketball, mask worn at all times, no jump balls, mask breaks halfway through each quarter, no underneath out of bounds, six feet away from a person inbounding the ball on the sideline, uh, one person at a scorer's table at a time. Gymnastics, masks must be worn at all times, athletes must sanitize hands prior and after competing on an event, equipment must be cleaned and sanitized at the completion of the rotation prior to another team using it. Hockey, similar, masks must be worn at all times, no locker rooms, players must come dressed, ready to go, put their skates and pads on at the rink. Uh, bench areas, only three coaches and players must be six feet apart. Ski modifications, masks must be worn, social distance at the start and finish line. Um, skiers um, must leave immediately following their event. You know, we're gonna follow all the EA state local guidelines um, and all the MIA and DESE modifications like we did in the fall. Um, we'll be asking kids before practice in games for COVID questions that they have to answer. If they answer yes to any of them, they won't be allowed to practice. Um, and we're gonna, you know, we're gonna have the same, we're not gonna, we're gonna advise students not to carpool to games or practices, wear masks at all times. Coaches will be responsible for make sure social distance is there. Students will come to the rink and court dress ready to play. All athletes will bring their own equipment. It'll be six feet away from everybody else's equipment and bags. They must bring their own water, hand sanitizer, must bring two masks uh, in case one gets um, damaged. Um, after, after games and practices, there's no um, team meetings. Everyone just uh, leaves after practice. Um, they don't, no, no one hanging around. And, and so basically what I'm asking tonight is to get approval uh, for girls basketball, boys basketball, girls hockey, boys hockey, gymnastics and skiing. Mr. Thielman. I'll put the motion on the table, so moved. Uh, Second. Can you, can you read it to us? Or a, a motion to uh, approve all winter sports, hang on, I have some language here. Give me a second. 
As determined by the Middlesex League superintendents. Yes. Would you like that motion, Mr. Thielman? Yes, that's the motion. I'm sorry. I didn't read it. Yeah. Second. Um, all right. Uh, discussion. Uh, Dr. Alice Nampi. Can you clarify again which winter sports we were talking about? I missed the list. Uh, boys, I mean, the, the ones that you want us to approve tonight. Uh, boys and girls basketball, boys, okay. boys and girls hockey, gymnastics, and skiing. Okay, thank you. Ms. Exton? I, I think you mentioned this, but I just wanna, what are the expectations for spectators? Um, spectators, I think that will be determined um, by the, the superintendent's meeting tomorrow. For the fall, we, we had one spectator per um, student athlete. Um, so I think they're gonna discuss that tomorrow at their meeting. So I would assume it's gonna be similar to that. Um, or possibly, you know, it being inside, you know, possibly could be no spectators, but I think they'll, we'll, they'll make that determination tomorrow. Mr. Hainer. Uh, Mr. Bola, will there be any videoing of this for the community? Yep, yeah, so for the, um, for the fall ACMI, they um, live streamed all the soccer games. So I talked to them uh, last week, they're gonna live stream all the varsity um, soccer and, I mean, uh, basketball and hockey games, and I'm gonna try to have them do gymnastics as well. Thank you. Mr. Schuchman. Um, <clears throat> what is the absolute deadline for us to have this approved? When will the sports start? Uh, December 14th is the first day of um, uh, tryout slash practice, the MIA. Usually it's the Monday after Thanksgiving, but the MIA on Friday pushed it to December 14th. Yeah, I would have appreciated instead of having the, this information being read to us at the meeting is to have had it in advance into Novus. This makes it much more difficult for us to think about this and vote it. Dr. Bodie. Um, the MIA is true. We could put the MIA regulations that came out at the end of last week uh, to you, and we apologize that that did not happen. Um, actually, tomorrow, the Middlesex League superintendents are meeting to discuss the, uh, the, re the regulations for MIA, look at the program, look at the schedules, spectators, as Mr. Bowler mentioned. Uh, but ultimately, you know, we have to still have a, an approval process that's going to go on tomorrow. I, I expect that they will be approved. There may be some modifications. What I can say is that the Middlesex League superintendents uh, would like the program to go forward. They, I think our athletic directors and our teams did a great job this fall in, in adhering to all of the guidelines. And um, we'll just have to play it by ear as the season goes on, because now we're moving from outdoor sports to indoor. So this is a, a motion to approve, but still subject to what happens in the, uh, um, the meeting tomorrow. The reason why you have to approve this program, and you won't have to do it in subsequent semester or subsequent seasons, is because the high school is remote. And the Department of Education said school, high schools that are remote had to have school committee approval. Uh, when the high, we're gonna talk about the high school this evening, uh, it may not be necessary beyond this particular um, meeting. Mr. Thielman? Yeah, so I, first of all, I, I support anything that can get kids into uh, activities uh, safely. And what Mr. Bowler has outlined is I think safe. And secondly, the way the motion is worded, it's, it's um, as uh, determined by the superintendent. So the superintendents could collectively decide in the Middlesex League that a sport might not be able to be continued because of safety reasons. So we're basically approving it subject to them, subject, subject to the, the superintendents possibly making a decision at some point in the season to modify their rules. So I'm comfortable, I'm, I think this is a safe, practical motion to vote for. So um, I'll come to you in a minute, Dr. Allison Ambi. I'm gonna take my chance to ask a question. So um, Mr. Bowler or Dr. Bodie, can you speak to the uh, position of the health department on winter sports, especially basketball and hockey? Um, 
I'm curious because they've recommended the six foot distances in our classrooms, um, which makes it very challenging to provide uh, a lot of in-person instruction at the high school. I think we all know that even with the um, changes to basketball and as not a basketball connoisseur, I don't really understand. I know what jump throw, jump, jump balls are. I don't understand the under hoop rule, but um, I think we all know that, that there will be a lot of kids a lot closer than six feet um, playing basketball. And I'm, I, I'm just really having a hard time understanding why we're making a recommendation to have kids do that in the gym. And um, we don't have, we, we have, must have their desks six feet apart down the hall. So um, if it's a health department thing or a, a, an administration thing, but I'm really struggling with the, the incongruity of these two things. And, and the fact that they're um, back to back on the agenda is, is ironic and unintended, um, but I need, to, I need to talk about it, so. Uh, Dr. Janger. So there are other people in this room more qualified to talk about some of this than I am, but you know, as you look through all of the different ratings, we are not allowed to have 25 gatherings of 25 or more in the state, but because school is a priority, we can have 100 kids in the cafeteria if we can keep them six feet apart. Um, so there, some of these things have been health department and other decisions made based on complicated things. But for the most part, when they've done analyses of these sports, they're much larger volumes of air. Um, and although kids are in contact, they're not in contact for sustained periods of time and they're wearing masks. So it's not, when the kids are six feet apart in the classroom, it's not, they're gonna walk past each other and sometimes be three feet apart. That's incidental contact, but they're also in a smaller enclosed space than a 12,000 square foot gym. Um, and that, that's part of what's been, the experience has been the kids playing soccer with masks on, they run past each other, they get close to each other, but they're not allowed to bunch up, they stay spread out. Um, and kids playing hockey in the rinks, which was for a period shut down um, because hockey was presenting a, an issue and they went to much stricter limits for everything except the game. And so that even at the end of the, at the end of a play, it's pretty typical in a hockey that everybody gathers together and now the kids are all determined to stay apart at the end of each play. And so over the course of the game, kids are really only close to each other kid, any given kid for a couple of minutes over the course of the game. And that's the rationale. Um, but it is, I mean, all of these things are, are a little bit mind boggling. And I, I feel like for us, people send me the epidemiology and I sort of have to trust that the epidemiology works and then work within those constraints. I appreciate that. I guess, you know, Charlie Baker's not asking for my opinion on bars and restaurants and indoor dining, best as I can tell. Um, but, you know, we're being asked our opinion about kids playing basketball in the gym when they're not, you know, when they need to sit six feet apart in classrooms down the hall. So, you know, that's, it's, it's very tricky. So I, I'd be happy to share my opinions on indoor dining and other things as well uh, that deprioritize having kids in school. So. Can I Dr. Bodhi, did you have something to add? I think uh, Mr. Bowler was also going to do that. I, I just want to um, uh, talk a little, just mention that the issue of the six foot was both um, the Board of Health and the school department that we felt jointly that this was an important distance at which we continue to feel. Um, I understand your concern and it's certainly something actually uh, when we met a couple of weeks ago, this was an issue for the Middlesex superintendents as well. So th there's gonna be uh, some discussion tomorrow. If, if there's any evidence as we start the season that there is a, um, you know, more than a singular case of COVID. I'm not even sure what the threshold will be yet. Unfortunately, that sport may not be able to continue. So we're gonna be monitoring this very carefully as we go through the season. But our overall feeling is that uh, this is a wonderful opportunity for kids. Um, you know, one of the things you, that the committee has talked about uh, with the high school, it, and we've heard from senior parents and other parents is the kids want opportunities to be together. 
And um, the sports program offers a wonderful opportunity for that to happen. The number, we had over 300 students in the fall, which was great. Um, so we're going to monitor this for sure. But right now, with these regulations and all that we're going to put in place, we hope there'll be a safe season. The fall was, and we're hoping the winter one will be as well. And yeah, and I also work with like uh, communication with the Board of Health and like I send them like a guideline for our practices and games for the fall. And then they would, they um, looked at them and made, and told me to make some adjustments. And I'll, I mean, I'll do the same thing in the winter. We'll put a guideline together, how we conduct basketball games, basketball practices, hockey, and um, mm -hmm. I'll get their input on how we can make things um, better and safer. Mm -hmm. Mr. Cardin. Thank you. So, so yes, I, I, I agree with Dr. Bodhi that we need to get kids involved as much as we can. I'm concerned a, a bit, however, though, that we, we tiptoe around the you know, Board of Health, the Department of Health, uh, we tiptoed around them about Wellness Day where we couldn't have a kickball game or something. But here, you know, we're going forward with basketball and hockey and in enclosed spaces. So, you know, I, I would encourage us to be a little bit more aggressive in our stance because we need to you know, we, we need to do as many activities as we as we can. Thank you. Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you. Um, I don't know hockey as well as basketball. Um, basketball I played in middle school and I'm concerned as is Ms. Morgan about spacing and, and how much time kids are really getting up close and, and in each other's face stealing the ball or, or um, going after rebound. All, there's all sorts of situations where you find yourself in a time when you're right next to face-to-face -face with the other player. And uh, in an enclosed mm -hmm. space, this is making me more concerned. Um, so I, I guess I'm asking, I'm saying this for the superintendent to hear it. Um, as you discuss it, uh, I didn't entirely follow what the consequences of all the, the jump, no jumps and or whatever would be. I can, I can figure some of them, but um, just the general sport, I'm just wondering about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, you know, I think we had a successful fall was following all the guidelines. I know we're going indoors. Um, I think if we if we don't offer sports like basketball and hockey, all these kids are going to be playing on AAU teams and there'll be 15 kids playing on 15 different teams. And um, I think we can do it safer and we can do it better for our community, keeping the kids here rather than going out and playing all over the state with all different players. Um, I think if we're allowed to have sports, we can. I feel very confident that it's safer than what any of these other programs are doing and we're keeping our kids together um, and keeping our community, you know, in Arlington and in, in around the Middlesex League. Mr. Hainer. Does the MIAA take into consideration the ventilation and everything else with all, with all the different things that have happened through the pandemic? As Dr. Janga just mentioned, the, the volume of the room affords the ability to have more people, but the air circulation is a major factor. I don't believe that they have made any recommendations on, on air exchanges, but we know as we've um, looked at our high school, we have uh, brought all of the rooms and that includes gym up to the, the original design ventilation numbers. So we're feeling very good about our gym. As a, as a place to play. Um, but I think all the concerns that you raise as a group are valid concerns. Um, and then it's one of these things where you weigh the risk versus the benefit. And at the moment, um, I, I think there will be some strong uh, feelings on the part of the superintendents that, the, that while there's risks, the benefits may outweigh those risks at the moment. This, the fall season was terrific, but I grant you it was outside. We're, as, I, we're gonna, as I said, we're gonna watch this very closely.
Mr. Hainer. I would ask through the chair that the superintendent keep the committee updated on a regular basis. And you normally do, Kathy, but I just want to make it a formal request. Sure. Certainly let us know what uh, y'all decide tomorrow. Um, I that, will. Would, yeah. that would be helpful. Uh, seeing as we're, we're ostensibly voting on a motion for you guys to make the decision <laughs> tomorrow. So that's not lost on me. Um, okay, uh, so motion by Mr. Thielman, seconded by, well, Mr. Thielman and Ms. Exton, uh, seconded by Mr. Hainer, I believe. Um, any more comment? Oh, uh, Dr. Alice Nampy. I'll vote for this motion given that the superintendent will be making the um, decision in conjunction with the other superintendents. Great. And I intend to support this motion actually because uh, Mr. Bowler's uh, description of what will happen if we do not offer sports is quite compelling. Um, I uh, feel decidedly conflicted that we are going to have kids right next to each other under a hoop in the gym and uh, really are struggling with how to get them into science class down the hall. Um, but that's our next agenda item. So I suppose we'll learn more at that point. But thank you, Mr. Buller. I think that was a really important point that I hadn't considered. And uh, so I, I, I appreciate that. All right, uh, time to vote. Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Hainer. Yes. And I am also yes. Uh, so the next item on the agenda is the Arlington High School reopening plan. Um, Dr. Bodie, are you going to speak to that initially or Dr. Janger or? Um, uh, Dr. Janger is going to speak to this, um, but I'm certainly going to be here in support and answer questions. Great. Uh, Dr. Janger. You're on mute, sir. Yep, thanks. So that's when I say my best stuff. Um, so do you mind if I just share my screen? I made a few slides um, sort of later in the day to supplement just to guide this sort of initial part of the conversation. Please and do. I'll switch over to a section. So I'm just gonna share right now. Um, so hopefully you are seeing Arlington High School semester two sample models. Is that what you're seeing right now? Yes. Okay. Oops. Um, going back. So the school committee has already heard from me sort of in a long meeting going through the sample models, as I've explained to everyone in the community um, in letters and surveys and presentations. It is unfortunately challenging to um, really get one's head around each of the logistics of each of the models. Um, I thought that today, what made sense to do, uh, given where we are with this was an update. We've already had a long conversation. There are surveys out. We're planning on meeting again on December 3rd um, to look at some of the information that we'll be getting between now and then. So what I was uh, focusing on today was to um, outline the master schedule structure for semester two to go over sort of what I understand to be the timeline for the decision, to give a little bit of information in answer to a lot of questions that I've been having around other supports and activities related to the second semester. Um, we were asked to take one more look at being able to create a two cohort option. So I will say a few words about that and throw that off to Mr. McCarthy, who has uh, hammered away at the spreadsheets to see if there was any way to make that possible. And then, um, and you can ask me to do this or not to do this, but I thought it would be helpful to briefly go through an overview of the three reasonable hybrid options that we presented um, before both, so we have that on tape for the community and an updated and hopefully slightly clearer version. And because I've been trying to respond to some of the questions so people could understand that. Does that seem like a reasonable approach for the evening? Ms. Morgan, any others? Sounds good. Okay. So first, uh, one of the things I want to just say is this is an unbelievably difficult situation, right? We are all extremely worried about our students, our children, our families. Um, I've been a principal since 2001, but I've never experienced 
such a sustained period of anxiety before there was at least a shift to some new normal or some understanding of the situation. So now we're seven months into this situation, eight months into the situation, and yet there's still an enormous number of perspectives. And I get those in people's letters. There are people worrying on sort of every version of how we do this. And for us, we as educators, I mean, that's what we do. That's why we're here. So we're extremely worried about the impact. Right now we've had the pandemic, We've had uh, the results to the economy, which is affecting many families. Um, we've had the situation with politics. We've had the sort of ongoing issues uh, around this conversation on racial justice. And all of that leaves us all really stretched pretty thin. And so I get letters and people are like, have you considered this? Have you considered that? I try to answer those. I don't answer all of them, I'm sure. I can try to answer them in these presentations, but I want to assure everyone in the school committee and anyone watching that um, we re I read every one of those letters. I, I look at every single proposal. I go back and try again every time somebody asks me to try something again. Um, we really are trying to consider those. And right now what we're trying to do, having looked at the logistics of the, the puzzle, the problem, um, we're doing our best to listen, to consider, and to balance off everyone's opinions. And I don't believe, unfortunately, that there is one clear path, one right answer. It's going to be a balance based on getting feedback. Um, but I also want to assure people that whatever choice we make between now and December 10th, um, the other concerns that people have, there are some people who are very focused on being remote and very worried about that. There are some people who are very focused on sort of the structure in terms of student support. There are some folks who are very concerned about their students having social interaction. There are some folks who are very concerned about their students having teacher guidance in person around activities, all those things and a wide range of others are concerns and none of those are gonna be set aside because we choose one model or another. Whatever model we choose from that model, that overarching schedule, we then build the supports, we then identify the students to put other things in place. So I think that's really important. At this point, um, you know, I may have preferences. I may think one of the ideas is a better or a worse one, um, but we really are approaching this with an open mind. That's the task we were given, which was to consider all reasonable models. And I came up with, you know, the best versions of each sort of option I could. Um, and we're going to look at the feedback that we get, and we're going to get a few different pieces. Um, and then we're going to do that. Also, um, Hopefully this presentation will give me a short, the most recent shortest summary. And based on that, I will either take clips from this presentation or make new ones. Um, there are people who are just having a hard time with the chart. So I will put little video clips in each of those charts for folks who haven't answered the survey yet um, so that folks can, um, can hear me sort of explain and talk through it. And hopefully that will give people some clarity. So jumping ahead. So through this whole conversation, um, we've, looking at, we've been looking at these primary focus goals. They came out of statements um, from guiding organizations and then from our focus groups. And this is what the survey information is focused on, right? Issues around safety, academic progress, mental health, social interaction, equity of access, students with disability, and the ability to pivot and respond to COVID. And some of this presentation is organized around that. So I want to hit some of those things that are going on in addition to or connected to. You've heard me say, um, and folks have uh, taken exception and I wanna be clear on it, that we aren't seeing a spike in serious mental health. That does not mean that people are not worried and it doesn't mean that we're not worried. Um, this is something we're really paying attention to. We're closely monitoring attendance, grades, referrals, our counselors and social workers are reaching out to the students on their caseloads on a much more regular basis and identifying additional students, reviewing the students that are in social emotional programs and our nurse case led referrals. As we look at that, we see students who are worried. We don't see spikes in mental health in hospital, and not when I say clinical mental health, though like severe mental health, mental illness. We do see people who are worried. We do see people who are isolated. We hear people's concerns. Um, the questions on the survey focused on priorities. I, thought very hard about asking a question about just how is your mental health? Um, but one, I'm not sure that an anonymous survey like that was the best way to get that. Two, that question 
has been asked on the district-wide survey to parents. So the questions on the survey focused on priorities in order to get a point of reference. So is, if mental health is your concern, is it more or less than academics? Is it more or less than social interaction? So that we could have a sense of how important it was in the view of the different respondents. Um, we were asked, we asked parents a question about concerns about mental health um, on the survey that went out from Dr. McNeil. And we're planning, and this is something I'm, I don't know, wouldn't say excited about, but I'm very pleased we're able to do this. So uh, I really wanna give a vote of appreciation to um, our social emotional learning, our guidance and counseling program. Sarah Bird has helped with a grant for this. So we're gonna conduct what's called the COVID-19 mental health screening in December and January. That's a, a screen of all students. And then using that screen, we can identify um, students who we feel like need support, either critical support, we would offer support groups, we would refer them if necessary. And that will really also help us to focus and structure program offerings. I would expect, just based on what we've seen at other schools, that we will find that around 20% of our students have some need or desire for mental health support. So when I say that we're not seeing a spike, it's not that we don't think that's a serious issue. Um, and so that's one of the things we're looking at. Social interaction is the next, and I want to assure people, although it's not the focus of this presentation, that senior events in particular and other spirit events in general are absolutely on our radar. Um, we're planning, I don't know if Dr. Bodhi and I have even discussed this, but when asked what to do for purchase orders, because we usually put all of our ordering and all of our planning for graduation at the beginning of the year, we have set up the purchase orders planning for a live graduation at Pierce. Now we'll have to see what the social distancing and what the guidelines are about that. It was something allowed in July. So we're hoping that by the time we get to June of this year, it's something that we're able to do again. Um, we will develop as we have in the past and then we are already working on with the student council, with parent supports, most likely working with the last blast committee and running it past the board of health for making sure that we have their blessing and questions. And we've been working on streamlining that process so that we can do more activities because I think these activities can be done safely by the school and therefore have some flexibility um, looking at activities that we can run. There's also a lot of other things we've already been doing and I hope folks will take a moment to look at those. There's um, Club Day had an enormous jump in students participating in clubs and signing up for clubs. If you look at the new club uh, website, there's 68 clubs with videos and materials on there. There's presentation there about Club Day and Club Act participation that's now a month old. Um, Wellness Day is going forward and a lot of students are signing up for that. I hope parents will make sure kids participate. We just talked about athletics and the link to the report of the school committee is just there for folks to be able to find the other things that we've already talked about. So I thought I would take one second just to give you a sense of the creative things people are doing in terms of bringing people in. The chemistry um, department has actually been bringing students in for outdoor labs after school for 30 minute labs in addition to their class time. I mentioned club day on the website. Math classes have come in and paced around the building. What you're seeing there is a picture of uh, Dr. V and his class burning our residual. We had thermite um, in our lab, which is not being transported to the new building because we don't need it and it's not safe. So Dr. V thought it would be particularly fun to burn it with a group of students. Instrumental music has been coming in, in and out of in before and after school. And it looks like there are some changes and guidelines that will hopefully allow us to do more in-person uh, work in the, in the building. So we're looking at spaces for that. Um, we've had students coming in for the BSU mural project. That's a mural that's being painted that will be hung up out, um, inside or outside or probably move around the school. The example you see on the right was a history field trip to the Dallin statue, um, which was actually supported by our diversity committee that is um, working on reinterpreting the Dallin sculpture and changing the school's approach to Native American symbols. So students went along and led that field trip. We've had therapy dog visits. That's our new therapy dog. Um, she's still in training, but will be a regular feature in the school going forward. GSA and other clubs have had picnics and activities. There's many more. I just thought these were some fun pictures. In addition, the next on that list of priorities is equity of access. Um, and I, I think we need to do a better job of getting the word out about these things. We're building out on them. 
Um, but the Learning Center, I just want to be clear, which is an in-school service with tutors, is available for students to attend on request, in person or remotely. Um, and so uh, that form has gone out. We'll send it out again in the next week or so. Um, parents can request and students can request that a student sign up for the Learning Center if they really want to be in a supervised environment. Study halls are also available on request for students who need a place to work um, in school access to Wi-Fi, a quiet location. So we've been making that available to all students. Special Ed at this point has expanded in terms of offering um, services. They've been reaching out to all students, not just high and moderate needs, to offer them in-person support. And we're talking right now about offering um, that students in the co-taught, whether they're in general ed or special ed, would be invited into the building um, so that those students could be more inclusive, those classes could be more inclusive. Um, we're also beginning right now, as we, we've just ended the term, we're reviewing the DNF reports um, in the next few weeks. And we are already looking at putting plans in place for both in-person and remote opportunities for credit recovery for students who have already fallen behind, um, who have no challenges in terms of participating in their class, which we expect to also bring more kids in. And the expectation, as I said at the beginning, is regardless of which model we do, or depending on which model we do, We'll be looking at targeted programs for next semester. So the timeline for the decision about the big schedule, which is what this presentation is supposed to be about. So uh, on the 24th, that's today, I'm presenting the hybrid options. Obviously, they've been presented before. Um, we have the survey is due on Monday the 30th, um, and that's organized around these priority areas, and it collects information on needs and trade-offs and some information as well about um, you know, uh, how sort of academic progress, um, levels of work, how much work teachers are doing, um, how much work students are doing, whether it's too hard or too easy. Um, and uh, with the students and the parents, I asked a question about whether in each of the models and in general, they would choose to be remote or would come in and participate in the hybrid options. And for teachers, um, it is a concern. So it was a question as to whether or not they might request a leave of absence, or if there was a remote academy, whether they would request the remote academy. Um, so that would give us some information for planning. So my expectation is that starting on the 30th, we've got someone set up, we'll create a dashboard, hopefully there'll be a public, and then a not public version, because some of the questions are, are more confidential. Um, and that is expected to be presented to this curriculum and instruction committee, if I've got this right, on the 3rd. Um, so then we will have a conversation about what those initial findings are and what that looks like they're showing us. And then hopefully on the 10th, we can make the final presentation with a decision about the semester two master schedule. And then, and this is the really important part that I wanna to get to as quickly as possible, from December 11th to February 8th, we're gonna develop and implement the semester two plan and all of those other sorts of supports that we've been talking about. Well, special education will need to reach out to every single student. We'll be looking for students on the five and fours, figuring out what other programming we might want to do um, and planning all of that out. So now the first thing we were asked to do um, was to give one more try to can we do the two cohort model? Um, and um, so the answer is, as we've said before, that at this point, the ventilation is on track to be repaired. There are a few spaces that are not gonna be available. There are some that don't even have ventilation, so they're not available. We've torn down walls in some of those spaces to create larger rooms to give us more um, area, but that's on track. The challenge we have is that the rooms are still small and few, and the small rooms, rooms limit the number of seats per classroom and that we have very few classes that can hold 12 or more students, which is half of a standard class. We only have 32 of those, and, in order to, and this, is, this is the basic math. To seat classes at 25 to 20, right, which is the range of a full class, we need 56, that's for 25, and 71 for classes of 20. In order to schedule, you really need to be around 85%. So we need between 66 and 84 classes in order to be able to schedule classes. We need eight classrooms for high needs programs. That's, um, and these are the classes that are currently, programs that are currently being run in the building for our high needs students, students who most need to be um, in these sorts of programs. Um, and 
um, we only have 32 that can hold 12 and an additional 12 that can hold 11 plus. So I think Mr. McCarthy can explain um, sort of two approaches that he took, I think, to trying to build the schedule. I will turn over the microphone to him. Thank you, Dr. Janger. So I was asked to talk a little bit about the procedure we used for scheduling. Um, you know, we've looked at the 50-50 cohort multiple times. Uh, so we did have a lot of that uh, information available. Um, there's two ways to go about scheduling. The first way, which we typically do, is we take our programmatic needs. Those are our um, programs like Reach, Compass, Summit, Harbor, Shortstop, ELL services. And those are the students that are currently in the building. And what we do is we, we designate their room and that room is used for that program for the entirety of the day. Classes are taught in their homeroom, things of that nature. So we usually, the way we typically build is we start off by building that. And then we build the rest of the schedule around those rooms and those schedules. So we tried to do that. We set aside a certain number of rooms. We assign them to the special ed uh, and the, the high needs programs. And we tried to build around them. And as Dr. Django just said in his numbers, um, we didn't have enough rooms that could accommodate those, those classes given their sizes in a 50-50 cohort. So the next process we used was to um, ignore the purpose of a room. Basically, we went in, we looked at the square footage of every room. I know people wanted us to be creative on this. So we went in, we looked at the square footage of every room. We didn't look at the intent of the room, the purpose of the room, what the room has traditionally been used for. It was just based on square footage. We ended up um, filling the rooms. Uh, what ends up happening is as we placed them, we ended up at 100% capacity. Now, that means we could fit the classrooms, the classes into the rooms. But here's where we hit the problems that come up. That would mean we would be ignoring the purpose of the room. So for example, chemistry would not be happening in a chemistry lab because of the design. Art would potentially not be happening in the art rooms. Um, uh, really any science class would have been bumped out of its lab, which has specific requirements as well as facts. Um, and really any classroom that had specifics, equipment, <clears throat> built into the room would not necessarily be in that room. And to be clear, the chemistry teacher would likely be moving from room to room, but none of them chemistry labs. And that was gonna be my next point. Part of making everything fit was if a teacher teaches a class of 30, period A, we would put them in one of the larger rooms to accommodate the 15 students that would be there. But then they would have to move second period because maybe they're teaching a class of 22 and they could fit in the 12 person room. And what you would have is every teacher and every student would be moving for a better part of the day. Um, not only does that impact the classes we have, but as I said earlier, the high need students that are currently mm -hmm. in the building, they would not have their home base, their standard home base. So a prime example is our REACH program. Right now REACH is using three classrooms in order to accommodate the needs of their students. If we were to maneuver those around to accommodate the needs of their students, each period that room would move somewhere else. And so they would not have their standard home base, which many of our students who are in high needs often need to take a break, to meet with a teacher, to meet with a social worker, um, and to have those moments of, of just refocusing their attention. The other problem we would face is, by saying we are taking this 24 person class and putting it in this room and it fits in this room. And at 50%, that's 12 students. We cannot add any students to that class anymore. Traditionally, we would say that class could add a student or two, um, whether a student transferred in, a student needed to change levels. There was a change in an IEP or a 504. Uh, we, would, we would move students around, but by capping the rooms, at these numbers, we're locking those classes in. So we can't add students. So physically, could we do it based on square footage? Yes. But ultimately, when we're looking at those numbers, it would 
eliminate the ability for students to change levels or really, I shouldn't say across the board, but most students it would eliminate their ability to change levels. I think it would hamper our high need students and groups. And it would cause people to move around the building every period, every teacher, every student would be moving around that building. Um, and so that, you know, that creates those problems that we've been seeing in terms of how large the building is and how we can accommodate these needs. Um, we have explored other options. Um, you know, obviously we've talked about the tents. Uh, we have very limited outdoor space, as you all know, because of the construction. Uh, the tents have been wonderful, September, October, November. Many of you might remember we had a snowstorm, uh, I think on October 30th. Uh, once snow starts, those tents are, are not viable. You know, the snow blows in from the sides. We came back from that snowstorm. We had to move reverse field trips because they couldn't be in the tent because of snow and wind. Um, so I think we... We want students in the building. We want them. I know Dr. Jenga is going to present on three plans that he has created to get students in the building more. But I don't think a 50-50 hybrid um, is going to function with the limitations of the building that we have. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll turn over to Dr. Jenga. I know he wants to speak more on the three options that he, he has developed. And, and so I just want to say like, we want to be clear, like we want and wanted to be able to do this. And, and Mr. McCarthy is a wizard at making things fit. And so this is not the first time we've made this effort to like really try to figure out if there's any way cutting and slicing and moving and shifting and doing all this to make it work. And each time he gets to this point where it's like, I, you know, he puts in the last jigsaw piece and we're like, wait, does this mean it works? And then you look at it and you're like, no, this actually means it doesn't work. Um, like it's just, it's not surprising that we can in the end fit the number of classes that we have into the number of rooms we have because it would have been impossible to run the school otherwise. But literally if a class currently has 15 kids in it, it goes into the room for seven, right? And it's in a room that can fit seven kids. And if one kid had, if one kid, fail to class this term, next term they have to retake it, they can't get into a class, they can't make a new schedule. No one can change their schedule, no one can add or shift. And we really, and we've shut down now in order to do this, all of the specialized programs. So all of the special education programs that need program spaces no longer have them. And there's a whole sequence of things. And, and what I fear is, the, the one thing I fear is that in our in our effort to get it to be like, and we're being transparent here. Like it, like we cram it all in. We could have showed you a spreadsheet where we, you know, box the corners out, but we crammed it all in number by number, and we're able to like fill in all the pieces and at hundred percent fit it. What that will result in is if we say let's keep trying to do that, is that in January, at the end of January, we'll be where we were at the end of August, where we will say it's just not going to work. That we just actually cannot staff run program like there's too many moving parts right now we're already talking about you know sections of spanish one that need to be split in half sections of language latin language and culture that need to be divided up none of that would be possible adding additional sections like we wouldn't be able to move a single thing we would be locked in to one thing and every other piece which is not in there wouldn't go in there so it really is just I, I have to just say, you're going to have to take our word for it. We can show you in other ways, um, but the, the numbers that we've showed you about why it doesn't work, they hold true even with all the creative problem solving that we we're able to do. So now I'm going to just jump to um, hopefully a rapid fire um, and at the same time, remarkably clear explanation of the three models that we were able to come up with, uh, did I share the right screen? So it should say three sample models, is that there? Yes. Okay. So, um, so as I've explained in the past, the purpose of these sample models was to try to, in different ways, maximize the amount of time that students were in school 
while maximizing the amount of teacher supported um, instruction that they had um, and um, minimizing uh, the amount of independent work. On this chart, in order to keep it short and fit in the boxes, there are three terms, in-person, remote, and independent. In-person means kids are in school in front of a teacher. Remote means that they're at home or somewhere else on the computer in front of a teacher. So that's remote synchronous instruction. And independent means what it says, that they're engaged in independent asynchronous instruction with no teacher. Um, and the trade-offs that we run into, unfortunately, are that if you can't divide the, stu the school in, in half in that way, you have to divide them into smaller cohorts. So in a one cohort um, model, I'm sorry, in a four cohort model, when a kid comes in for one day, three quarters of the class are not there. So the three models, and I'm not gonna go into all of the sort of constraints and explanations at this point, because I'm trying to keep it short. So there's three models that really capture the basic options, four cohort model. In that model, we divide the school into four groups by house, essentially, Fusco, Downs, Column, and Remote, any student who chooses not to come in. Those are your four cohorts. In that model, every student keeps their current course. We keep the current course offerings. Obviously, students can switch courses, but it keeps the current schedule and the current uh, model. All of these models are built on the semesterized schedule, so the student has three to four courses a week. Um, and in that model, the student would come in for 40 minutes in person. Um, they would have three afternoons where they'd have 50 minute remote instruction, and they'd have the remainder of their mornings independent, and then they'd have the other independent work. The 450 number that's in each of these is our targeted number in terms of weekly instruction. Um, so if you look in our current model, students are four by 80 plus 130 minutes expectation of independent work to hit that 450 model. So the next model is the departmental shift that also keeps all of our offerings that um, also allows students to keep all of their schedules in both the four cohort and in the departmental shift. Students who choose to be remote stay in the same classes with everybody else. So in that model, you would have four, it would look very much like the current model. It's the most like the current model. In many ways, it is built on the current model, but instead of reverse field trips, we have a regular rotation of in-school courses um, so that each class then every two weeks has a 60 minute class instead of a reverse field trip. Um, and otherwise the rest of their instruction is remote. So that means they have four 80 minute remote classes every week. And once every two weeks, one of those is replaced with a 60 minute in-person class. So what's the impact in terms of social interaction? In the four cohort model, you would be coming into classes of around six, a quarter of your class. You would do that three 40 minute classes in, or sorry, three 40 minute classes in one day or four. So you would see six kids in that class once a week. In the departmental shift, you would come in for that class every other week and see most likely the entire class. And what we would be using is spreading out in the larger spaces. One of the things we were excited about was when we realized that we were actually going to be able to get the ventilation fully functioning in all of our large spaces, we had this exciting moment when we realized that we could run enough classes at a time that we could run a department through the building in two days. And then the grade shift cohort combines two different approaches to allow us to actually have 50-50 cohorts, but only every other week. And so that was the closest we could come to the two cohort model, that you could run a two cohort model every other week. And the way that works is you divide the school, ninth and 10th grade is one group and 11th, 12th is the other group. Um, and then in, in the week when ninth and 10th graders are coming into the building, those students are split into two cohorts. So then they have an AB cohort. And there's an example of what we think is the best way to do that. But if we moved in that direction, we'd find, we would obviously refine any one of these models a little bit as we went forward. Now, the challenge of that is that it is a complete schedule change. 
So in that situation, what we need to do is first, all of the classes and it's math, world language, um, almost all elective arts, um, have, multi, have great kids across all of the grades. So those would have to be split. We need to create a remote academy. So by splitting the school into three groups, you would have to significantly increase staff to cover and most likely significantly decrease course offerings to students. Um, but what those students would get under those is that during the week when they were in the hybrid, the 50-50 cohort, they would have 280 minutes in person, and then they'd have two a days of independent work, much like what they're doing at the Audison. And during the remote week, they'd be following a schedule much like what we're doing now, which is four 80 minute periods. So now I'm gonna quickly go through again, how each of these works individually in just a little more detail. So what we're looking at here is the four cohort model. Um, and the way to read this chart is if you look at the light red and the dark red, that's all the same class. So it's A block. Um, the light red, if you'll notice, is numbered A1, A2, A3, and AR. That's your four cohorts. So what one would imagine is if you're in a Spanish class, for example, during block A, you and you are in Fusco House, that means you're in the first cohort. So you would come in with your Fusco House uh, classmates on Monday in the morning for your four classes. And then you would have travel time to go home. And then in the afternoon, you would have your remote classes. Now, the reason why we have this as the approach is because this means that every student every day has some class and maintains the connection. It also means that the loss of instruction is only is limited to the, the three days when you are not in the cohort, which would be Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday for students in cohort one. So how does that look? This student, and I use this student in all the examples, they're in Downs House. They are taking four classes just to make sure you can see all the options, chorus, chemistry, English, and history makes them a junior. So that student in a given week, in their hybrid week, that student would come in on Monday, they would be doing independent work. They'd come in in the, I'm sorry, in the afternoon, they would not come in, in the afternoon, they would have remote classes in chemistry, English, and history. Tuesday, again, their morning is independent work. And then in the afternoon, chorus, English, and history. Um, on Wednesday, at this point, we're running it like a normal Wednesday. And Thursday, that student would come in and have chorus, chemistry, English, and history in person with a quarter of their class for 40 minutes. Now, chorus would work most likely a little differently, but that's the basic model. They'd then travel home and have chorus, chemistry, and history um, at home remotely. And then you can see the same on Friday. So the features of that model is it keeps the current remote course offerings for all. It does not require a remote academy. Those students are able to stay in because they are in, as you see up here, the fourth cohort is remote. Um, their academic time is 1.40 and 3.50s in front of a teacher, either in person or remote, and 260 independent. The trade-off is that for that 40 minutes in person, you've lost 130 minutes of teacher contact time under our current model. Other issues with this is the short period is challenging for labs, it's complicated. Social interaction, as we said, is six students, one time per week. And um, we think that this would still be challenging for the schedule because um, the plus is we have 70 rooms that can hold eight or more. We need 57 to 71 to seat. So as you see, we'd be there and we believe we can do it, but it would be tight. So the next model, and this is the one that is most similar to what we're doing now. Many people have written to me after I sent the survey out saying, why didn't you include the current model as one of the options if we would prefer that? The reason I didn't include the current model is because this is very much built on the current model as sort of a better and robust, more robust version. Um, so if people really like the current model, um, they probably would like this one and should preference this one. So the idea here um, is 
that the standard schedule was remote, but what we have found is that because we have six to eight, depending on how you count, large spaces, the gym, old hall, the pit, the cafeteria, the theater, and the other gym, um, and you can divide those in half, that gives us eight spaces. That means that we can run the entire English department through those eight spaces in the course of two days. Um, and so that to us gives us an opportunity with much less loss of structure and much less loss of contact time, that gives us an opportunity to have students come in. Now, by our experience, we find, and by looking at MapQuest, that you can get to the high school from just about every corner of Arlington in about 30 minutes. Um, and there's obviously some complicated issues for students who live outside of Arlington, and we will address those with study halls and other programming. But what that means is that a student can come in for an A block class at the beginning of the day, leave 20 minutes early, um, and have time to transition back to B block. We then have lunch as a transition time. Um, and then the same thing with C and D block. Now, some students may choose not to, or some students may find that they're not able to transition during the subsequent period, but that's okay. In fact, I think it's an advantage of the model because we have the learning center, the study halls, and other spaces where students can work in the school, get support, and I think also normalize, which is important for a lot of our students who are struggling the most, normalize the experience of being in the building, socially distanced, potentially being on Zoom calls um, from the building with a mask on. Um, so the idea is that if you rotate through, um, English, math, history, and world language can rotate through the larger classes, spaces. And our plan then is to take science, the labs, science labs, art, faculty, and consumer science labs, and to build out essentially double spaces so that they can run a lab with all or half of their class um, all at the same time. Right now, our labs, for example, can only handle about five or six kids at the same time, but all of the chemistry labs are together and we can rig them and bring a um, bring some telecommunication in terms of monitors so you can see from one space to the next, bring in a paraprofessional to help support and have a specialized double chemistry lab, double physics lab, double bio lab, double uh, foods lab, double art lab. So those would be on a separate rotation that they'd figure out. The result of that is that a student with three or four classes, depending on their rotation, will come in on an average of about one and a half to two times a week. So what would that look like? Let's go back to our sample student. Sample students in chorus, chemistry, English, and history in that order. Um, and so on their two week rotation, and I kind of made this up, it could move around a little, but the basic idea is they come in on Monday. I'm sorry, on Monday, they take their chorus and chemistry class remotely. They then have 40 minutes to come in over the lunch block for their English class. They then have 30 minutes to either transition home or to go to a study hall um, and take their block D class. And then as you can see, as you go through this, they, each day a remote class, this day they all come in again for one hour, then they have two remote classes. Their Thursday is all remote. Their Friday, they have chorus, chemistry, English. Now, some students only have three classes. So imagine they don't have chorus. Um, and then their rotation would be these two days um, of the first week um, and these two days of the second week. That would be their rotation. So they'd be coming in a couple of times a week. So the features of that. So again, this keeps the current course offerings for all. Um, it builds the most on the current model in that there maximizes the four times 80 remote classes with 130 independent minutes. The loss of instruction for that 60 minutes of in-person is 20 minutes walking to the school, um, which may actually be good for kids. Um, it does not require remote academy. Either the students in the remote academy would get an alternative assignment or a teacher could choose to have them simulcast in. That's not a requirement. Simulcast is a choice on the part of the teacher. It's something that we are not allowed by contract to require or expect, but it may work for some school classes depending on how they're organized. 
Um, so as I explained, we would create these separate labs and the social interaction in that case would be one meeting with an entire class, socially distanced, um, once or twice, well, every one or two weeks for the class and once or twice a week for every student. And now we come to the grade shift two cohort model. So in order to use the spaces that we have that will hold half a class, we could divide the school into ninth and 10th and 11th and 12th aid shifts, and then alternate. One would be a remote week and one would be a hybrid week. Um, and so in that case, looking at your sample student again, so our sample student is a junior, they're in cohort one, um, because they're in, um, in this case, so I put them in the wrong house. In this case, well, they're in the first half of the alphabet. Um, so they're junior, they're in cohort one, they've got co chorus, chemistry, English, and history. So this looks more like the standard two cohort model. In the hybrid week, they would come in for a full day, um, two days, they'd have their Wednesday, and then they'd be independent for two days, Thursday and Friday. In their remote week, they would um, have all remote classes just like we have now. So the nice thing about that is you get the advantages of the, the hybrid model. Um, you've only done it every other week. The disadvantage is it requires us to completely change the schedule. It would reduce course offerings and it would require us to have a remote academy. Students in the remote academy, we would estimate, although it, you know, we will see what the results are in terms of what the numbers are that would request the remote academy under this model. Um, but based on our experience over the summer, we would think it's somewhere between 13, 20% of students requesting remote, it may go up under the current um, situation. And so the numbers of students in the remote academy determine in part what offerings, if it's 15 or 20%, It'll be more narrow. If it's 70% of the school chooses the remote academy, then they would get the bulk of offerings, but then the 30% on the other side would get a reduced options. Um, basically, we have to look at staffing, the choices of the students who are actually in that cohort. Um, and then just like we build the schedule every year, we staff as many sections as we're able. But the result of this, because we're dividing the school both 9, 10, 11, 12, and remote academy would be um, a significant reduction in course offerings unless we had a significant increase in staffing. So the academic time, as you'll see here, on a hybrid week is two times 80 in person with 310 minutes of independent work. Um, and in the remote week is four times 80, which is 320 minutes of face-to-face um, -face online instruction and 130 minutes of independent work. The social interaction, would be for each class, 12 students, two days every other week. And um, we're able to do that because we have 32 to 44 classes. We need 37 to 44. So again, it'll be tight, um, but we believe we could do that. So returning to those three models, as you can see, the issues are four cohort model, keeps all the course offerings, does not require a remote academy, three to four classes per week, the trade-off is you have 40 minutes in person um, in exchange for three mornings without um, teacher-led of independent work and three 50-minute remote instructions, 260 independent. And what you get from that in terms of social interaction, not teacher contact, is six students in each class for 40 minutes each week. In the departmental shift, that keeps all the course offerings again, does not require a remote academy, three to four classes per week. In that case, you have a schedule that looks like our current schedule, which is four times 80 remote classes a week for each course. And once every other week, you come in for a 60 minute in-person class. What that gets you in each class is 25 students in a larger space for 60 minutes every other week, which is over three classes about one and a half times. And then the grade shift cohort model is a complete schedule change where it's needing for a remote academy, resulting in reduced course offerings and increased staffing needs. Um, three to four times a week. During the hybrid week, you get two 80 minute in person and 310 independent. 
during the remote week, you get 480 minutes of remote synchronous instruction and 130 independent. And the social interaction you get for that is that you get 12 students for those two days for 80 minutes every other week. So that is essentially where we are. I think that is the end of my presentation. Great, it's great. funny when you're looking at the screen because I think I'm going to come back and you guys will all be asleep. <laughs> no, I think we're all paying good attention. Um, okay, so uh, questions and comments. I, I, we can go in our usual order or we can take them as they come. Let's see, let's see if we can do it without our usual order just for this one, see how it goes. It's gonna go wild. Uh, Mr. Schlickman, I saw your hand up. Mr. Schlickman, you're still on mute. Trying to do, trying to do 17 things at once here. The three sam sample models uh, chart, Dr. Changer, um, if we could get the, the status quo or what we did on the first semester in that chart, just as a baseline of comparison, I think that would be helpful. Done. Okay. Secondly, um, and, and I think- Can I just say, um, look at the departmental shift and mm -hmm. cross out the 60 minutes and add reverse field trip. Okay, just, just to have that column. Yeah. So it, yeah, it, no, it, I will it, do that, it, makes sense, yeah. It, it's a foundation. Because I know, you know, I, I, I heard what you were saying to the parents when they were asking, well, what if we like what we're doing now? What do we pick? Uh, or how come there's no response for, uh, can we stay with what we've got? So uh, people are complaining that that's a flaw of the survey. And at least in terms of making a decision on our side as to where to go, uh, that would be helpful. The second thing, I guess, is more of a technical question for Mr. McCarthy. Um, having scheduled a school and understand the uh, terminology of satisfaction rates, uh, when I hear about the 100% room utilization and a total inflexibility in terms of the scheduling process, that, that makes me very, very nervous. Um, and I, I've always looked at the success of the schedule in terms of the satisfaction rates for the students. So the question really is, have we modeled this out with uh, current student requests as to what the satisfaction rates would be on any of these models? And if not, do you have an estimate? So I, I, I don't have an estimate, but I can say in terms of um, part of the reason that we went all remote for a semester was to make mm -hmm. sure that students received the requests that they made in, this, in, in last year. Mm -hmm. Didn't have to eliminate courses. Um, and so what I did was when I, when I looked at this schedule trying to build a 50-50 cohort, mm -hmm. um, I based it on the courses the students are currently in. Mm -hmm. Assuming that because we, we didn't have class caps, we didn't set those up, um, we had the standard class cap, we didn't shrink the classes, mm -hmm. that students were placed into the courses that they had requested last year. And our guidance department has worked with them to place them in the correct courses. Now, um, so I would assume that's 100% satisfaction because the students have the courses they're requesting and the students, the courses they need to graduate. Mm -hmm. When we're looking at these other pieces, I know the, the two examples Dr. Janger just laid out, um, two of them use the current enrollments of the courses that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, the third one, which I, I know I'm going to forget on the name, Shift 2 Cohort, I believe is the title, mm -hmm. um, that, would that would cause a rearranging of the students' mm -hmm. requests and potentially moving courses around. So we do try to bait, we are trying to base it on what the students have already requested. Part of that is because we went with a block schedule. Mm -hmm. And so in order to make it a full year, we didn't want to offer certain courses the first semester, mm -hmm. not offer those the second semester mm -hmm. and say to students, well, we're not going to be able to offer enough English classes second semester or enough math classes first semester. We tried to spread it out to make sure we could accommodate all of those requests. Yeah, I mean, you know, English classes, generic 10th grade English classes are easy to schedule. It's a singletons and when they overlap. Yeah. Uh, so when you have... Uh, 
when you scheduled for the fall, did you build the, the master schedule with the requests that were set so that if we didn't change anything, we have a schedule set for the spring? I, I think I'm understanding your question. I want to try and explain it, but if I have it wrong, let me know. Mm -hmm. What I what we do is we have to build the schedule for the full year. Mm -hmm. and so all the requests, the schedule is already built for the spring. Mm -hmm. And so we are taking what already exists and we're trying to maneuver it to get as many students into the building on a regular basis. Does that, I guess I'm not really understanding. No, that's, that's exactly the question I asked. So there is a schedule sitting at the computer saying for any given student that you're going to have course A, course B, course C, and course D in the spring. And it's going to meet in these time blocks and, and it all works. Yes. Okay. And the, uh, uh, department shift uh, preserves the schedule. Yes. yes. Okay. So the only thing that would so the first two models we saw preserves the current schedule. It's just a rearranging of time. So the courses the kids were scheduled into are preserved for uh, for the spring. Yes. And the third one, which is the reshift uh, chaos model, requires a total reschedule for the spring. It would require maneuvering around, yes. Uh, eliminating courses. And so the first two uh, schedules, uh, if we are forced to go remote uh, due to COVID issues, we can do that. Or if uh, uh, Anthony Fauci is correct and all of a sudden in the spring, we can have all our teachers vaccinated and uh, in sometime in April or May bring everybody back, we can do that equally easily within the first two models. Yes, that's just a, it would just be a question of changing a bell schedule. It wouldn't have to change any courses. Um, Great. I, mean, I would, I, I actually think that the departmental shift would be easier mm -hmm. because it would be a very odd schedule to come in in person and go to class for 40 minutes in the morning mm -hmm. and then the same class for 50 minutes in the afternoon. No, we could re rearrange the bell schedules to run block A, block B, block right. C, block D. That's not a problem. But it would mean that teachers who had now planned ahead for 40 and 50 minute splits and mm -hmm. independent work would now be shifting over to a, a completely different format. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I understand that. But uh, uh, I'm concerned about the flexi flexibility if we go to some sort of a hybrid model that we can very quickly lean back into a full remote and then get into uh, full, full everybody in the building when the vaccinations and the uh, spread rates uh, uh, allow us to. Mm -hmm. Thanks, th th this has been enlightening. Mr. Thielman. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Jang and Mr. McCarthy for the work you put into this. I, I realize there's, and I appreciate Mr. McCarthy's explanation of the challenge of the 50-50 hybrid model. I think that answered a lot of parents' questions. <clears throat> so my questions are, in all of these models, there is a remote academy option. So if a family says, great, thanks very much for your work, Dr. Janger. Thanks very much for work, work, Mr. McCarthy. I still want my student to study remotely. They can study remotely. <clears throat> Just as a point of clarification, because the language has come back to haunt me. Yeah. Um, in the first two models, there is a remote option. That remote option is you're in classes with everybody else remotely. In the third option, there is a remote academy. Okay. So, okay, fine. So, the reason why is because I have parents who then are confused and they say, I thought my kid was in the remote academy. And you're like, your kid's remote in the yeah. same class. But they can, in either option, the there's, there's a parent, always a remote option. There's yeah. always a remote option. So the question that some parents have asked me to ask you is that um, if they, how would their, how would the remote option under these three, the remote option in either one or the three options compare to the semesterized schedule they're experiencing now? Um, largely indistinguishable. I, so no, I, I take that back. That's not true. In the first model, um, they would have three independent 40 minutes and they'd have three independent mornings and then they'd have a day where their kid was getting remote instruction in a small group. 
Mm -hmm. Right. And then in the afternoons, they'd have remote classes. In the second model, it would be largely the same, but one class out of every 10 classes, um, the rest of the class would be going into the school and they would either get an independent piece of work for that one class or they would simulcast into the class, depending on how the teacher wanted to do that. And then in the third model, they would be in a completely separate remote academy where the offerings would be determined by the numbers of students and the staffing available and the requests that they had. Okay, all right, all right, thank you. Um, the other thing I, I asked you, Dr. Jang, in an email, just, if you can just, several pe people have asked um, why Arlington can't adopt a model like Lexington, given that Lexington is an older building as well. Um, did you do any research on that at all? Sure, I mean, the simple version, I mean, I talked to Andy Stevens who describes that schedule as the schedule calculus. Um, he's in my group, we've been talking every two weeks for the last six months. But the simple answer is it's a two cohort model with simulcast. Yeah. Is um, so, and not the, and the simulcast isn't the big thing. The real issue is it's a two cohort model. The reason why their schedule looks so complicated is because they have eight classes. So we don't need that complexity. If we had Lexington's building and our and Lexington's students, we could do a two cohort model. We would do sort of, sort of very simple to uh, model because we wouldn't need the eight slots. Okay. The um, the, the next question um, is, can you explain the why, uh, you know, the, the Wednesday schedule? So <clears throat> um, several people have said, well, you know, um, if the Wednesday schedule were not so uh, sacred, the Wednesday day were not so sacred, students would actually, teachers would actually have more time with students and they would have less of a reason to use uh, that, those Wednesdays for conferences, meetings, uh, et cetera. Can you explain the Wednesday situation to people? Yeah, so I thought, I, I thought well, I won't even look. I was gonna look to see, I had a slide about that in the thing. But, so first of all, we have to put PE somewhere. Right, so PE was sort of taken out of the schedule to give us more room in the rotation as a remote class. So if we took PE out and put it 40 minutes on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, I could give you three 40 minute remote classes on when four 40 minute remote classes on Wednesday. The trade off would be that instead of four 80s, you'd have four 70s and one 40, same amount of time, and you'd lose time in transition. So that's one piece. Um, the, the second piece is, uh, it doesn't buy you very much, right? We could decide to throw out PE and not have PE at all. And you get one more 40 minute remote lesson, but again, it doesn't solve the problem of the schedule. And then let's flip around the Wednesdays is are saving us, right? The teachers are back to back with kids, not meetings they're with kids they're planning and you'll see in the survey one of the questions i asked the teachers was how much time are you spending per week outside of class on grading prepping following up with kids um there's a bunch of other pieces of things they're doing the x block you know is the place where we are going to have those activities it's where club days fall and it's where you know, if we're going to bring students in on a regular basis, the clubs are meeting during those times. The teachers are supervising those meetings, we're running activities. Um, you know, and the reason why our attendance is not, I mean, every other school I talk to, they're, they're like, oh, we're having terrible attendance problems. And we're like, we're up a little. I'm not bragging that we're like, we were already at 96%, but we're up, we should be down, right? Like, it's not like that's, Seeing even would have been thrilling. Going down one percent, I would have been, I would have been pretty happy. So the fact that we're actually up, that's because teachers are on top of it. They're following up with kids. We're following up with kids. D's and F's are because teachers are, you know, teachers are double time. If you've got three classes, don't tell anyone this, Julie. But if you've got three classes, you're in a heavy load because you're teaching six, not five, um, because each of those classes is running double time. Um, and so if you've got Two classes, you're teaching four because you're um, you're a little light. But either way, it's a heavy load, 
and everything you're doing is is much more grading, much more following up, and staying on top of kids. That's why kids support is there. So I mean, I think um, when once we decide, don't I will sit down with teachers and see if there's anything clever we can do with Wednesdays. But I think we are making incredibly efficient use of that time, and in many ways, it is the salvation of the schedule because it allows us to have some flexibility to bring kids in. Field trips are coming in on Wednesdays. Activities are coming in on Wednesdays. The core, you know, band and chorus use the spaces on Wednesdays. A lot of things are happening at that time. All right, thank you. My, the last thing is that you know we agreed that you would um, uh, collate the re the results of the family survey by Thursday the third with the curriculum committees. But I also, you know, I think we're all going to be interested in knowing what the faculty thinks about these options too. So I'm assuming you're going to there are three surveys: is a faculty survey, a student survey, and a staff survey. Okay, so all that will be. I will present all those on the. Yep. Okay, this one will be clear. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Allison Abbey. Thank you. Um, first, I wanted to make a comment on the two cohort model, um, just for our public. I think yes, we can get everyone into the building, but because of the effects on our more fragile populations and and students, we're not able to educate all of our students when we do that. And I think that's a real take home. And it's a reason why I will vote against anything that suggests that we should try and pursue that. Um, second, uh, when we had the CIA, uh, I mentioned, I asked the question about the possibility of simulcast. And I was asked, or I was told, you know, what, what benefit would simulcast bring? And I, just want to point out that the benefits simulcast would bring look pretty different when you look at these different options. You know, being able to do simulcast in the four cohort model means that instead of 260 out minutes of independent work, they'd have 260 minutes more of teacher in teacher contact time, however you put that. Um, in the departmental shift, it's not as much different. Um, in the uh, grade shift to cohort, it also gives benefits with 310 um, independent. I haven't gone back and tried to make sure that there is teacher working when there's independent work going on. So it, it might not work for those reasons, but my point is just that maybe simulcast doesn't help us well for for right now it doesn't help us at all right because no one's going into the building um but it could help in the field trips and it definitely could help in some of these models so and and i understand that we have made um agreements and stuff i'm just pointing out that there are when it was brought up it the sense was that it really didn't help anything. And I'm just pointing out that it, to me, it feels like it could help some stuff for our students. So that's all. But just to clarify though, I, I do wanna give some credit where credit is due. Simulcast is happening in varying forms in the COTA classes, depending on how one defines it. And it's happening in many of the small group and academic support classes voluntarily on the part of those teachers. Um, so people are putting it into place when they can make it work. Great, thank you. Ms. Exton. Um, thank you, Dr. Jenger and Mr. McCarthy for all of um, your work. I, um, I'm particularly interested in the teacher's perspective and I agree with Mr. Thielman that it would be important to see the results of their survey um, next Thursday. All of these models require teachers to make yet another shift in their delivery of instruction. They've already shifted to a semester, they've shifted to remote teaching, and now we're asking them to revise their teaching again into a hybrid semester. One of the models is 40 minutes and then 50 minutes. Um, and so I think we're asking a lot of them and I think that we need to be mindful too of how we're supporting them in successfully delivering their content in whatever model we choose. Um, so I think we, we need to be really mindful about the results that we see from, from the survey for them because it's going to impact the 
um, successful implementation and the learning um, that students are going to get in the spring semester, depending on what we decide. Um, so along those lines, I guess one question that I have is, um, do you have, from the survey, will we have a sense of teachers that are willing to simulcast? Um, I'm not suggesting that we, that we open it up to make them do that, but I have heard in other districts where it's an option that it's been successful, it's been easier. So just figuring out if that's something that teachers are open to. Um, and then my other concern about teachers is do you have a sense of how many might decide to take a leave when they're asked to come back in person? Dr. Jager, you're that. on mute. Um, so no, I did not ask the question about simulcast. I did ask the question about leaves of absence for each model. Um, I, I'm a little loath to start, you know, admittedly, I'm, I'm like a poll watcher. I'm checking the thing every two hours, but um, I feel like we should let it ride. I will say that um, the numbers differed depending on the model in terms of how many said they would, uh, would or would ask, would consider a leave. Um, and I, we can certainly talk about that as one of the issues. And I don't, I mean, I don't even know if teachers would want to <laughs> offer up that they'd be willing to simulcast, but it just, um, it would be interesting to get um, perspective on, on where they are with that. But I realize- well, and, I, and I think the willingness of teachers to do it as part of a context in a class where they've been trained, where the class is set up for the time, where the program is set up, you know, is, is a very different thing. Um, and, you know, so but again, um, I actually trust that our teachers will do it in the ways that are the most effective, but we're not in a position at this point to set up a program with the assumption. And um, I, mean, I, got, I guess I would just start there. I mean, we're just, you know, and, and I'm not, again, I'm not sure, like, is it a big game? I, I don't know, but it's not it's not an option that I have available to me, so it's not a, a question I ask. And then mm -hmm. I just one concern about um, the shift departmental shift model um, is just thinking about kids like knowing when to come to class. Like Monday, it's at one o'clock. Tuesday, it's at ten o'clock. Um, just you know, the one in person. So just something that people will keep in mind is their sort of how you're supporting students and remembering to come into the building. Thank you. Um, Ms. Keyes and then Mr. Cardin. Yeah, I just want to comment on the simulcast because we do have it in the MOA that that is by volunteer only. And what ended up happening with special ed is they were all scheduled into it and then told, well, if you don't volunteer, it's going to be a nightmare. And I get more concerns from my members about that particular issue at the high school right now than any other issue in the district. Um, people don't like it. They don't like doing it. Um, they don't wanna do it. They're kind of stuck doing it because that's the way it was scheduled. And they're willing to do it because it's good for the kids, but it's killing them. So this idea that there's gonna be a whole bunch of volunteers for this in the spring, I think is really, really unfounded. And I can tell you my phone's blowing up right now with people being like, I don't want to do this. Why do they say we're going to do this? Why do they think we want to do this? So we have an agreement that like this would be volunteer only. And Mr. Changer's right. Like we can't build a schedule assuming there's going to be a lot of volunteers on this. Mr. Cardin. Thank you. Um, so a couple of points. One is that, you know, we're, we're still under the reason for our motion to re require uh, the administration administrative team to, to present a hybrid option to us is because we're required by DESE to maximize in-person learning, except for extenuating circumstances. So when our building wasn't ready, we had extenuating circumstances, but our building is now is ready. So we have to find a way to maximize in-person learning. And so, you know, what I had hoped from this process, and I still hope that it can happen, is that we go to the teachers, we go to the staff, we go to the parents, we talk about what our needs are. Uh, there, there are a group of students, more than 100, less than all of them, that um, are not doing well right now. And um, 
uh, maybe it's just socially, but it's also academically because they, they can't fully pay attention to an 80 minute class remotely. So I, I really would like a more collaborative approach, you know, and, and maybe that's been built into these options, but it's hard to tell, um, to, to try to solve, everybody to try to solve the problems that we're having um, uh, and maximize and fulfill the requirement for DESE that we maximize in-person learning. So as, as we continue to have these conversations, um, you know, I, I, I do hope it's in the spirit of collaboration uh, going forward and that everybody contributes to the solution um, because the status quo is, is not an option in my opinion. Uh, and I don't think it's allowed by DESE. Uh, so I, I do thank you, um, Dr. Jenger and, and Mr. McCarthy for the work on the 50-50 um, hybrid. What, what I heard, and, and I know you have a, may have a slightly different twist, Dr. Jenger, but I heard it, that it, it is possible, uh, but it's just very undesirable for a, a lot of reasons. Some of the reasons you presented, um, as Dr. Allison Ampey, you know, uh, noted, um, if it truly would require disrupting those special ed programs, if that's the only way to do it, then, then obviously that's a that's a very high negative. But you know what? The the um, grade shift. Uh, uh, the, the grade shift to cohort plan also has some extremely high negatives. Redoing everybody's um, schedule when, I mean, Mr. Shilkin, that, that schedule is not only in the computer, it's been given to all of the students. So they, they're expecting to have certain classes in the spring. Um, so, so that model as well has some very serious negatives. So I, I mean, I see, um, uh, you know, the, the two cohort option as well as that option as, as in the sort of the same category, they're both possible but undesirable. And, and some of the things that you mentioned, you know, to me aren't, aren't that big of a deal. We're not doing chemistry labs now. We're not doing art in person now. That wouldn't be a change from now. So, um, so I, I'm not ready to take that completely off the table at this point. And we'll, we'll see going forward what happens. Thank you. Mr. Heer. My limited experience as a teacher, as a person who's negotiated contracts for 30 years and as a school committee member for the past several years. DESE is the least last group that I'm really gonna worry about. The safety of these kids are the number one priority. I think that is the number one priority of this committee. Um, Dr. Janga and Mr. McCarthy have put a, an awful lot of effort into this. I wanna see every kid back. I wanna see every kid's emotional state at, at least back to where it was a year ago. Uh, the biggest, thing that I am concerned with is that we don't look at the entire picture, that we react. Uh, as far as the idea of simulcasting and teaching a class and watching everything, I'll be honest, as a former teacher, I'd like to have at least one aide watching the camera, watching who's focusing and where it's going. I cannot imagine doing that and delivering quality education. Uh, those teachers that do it, I have the deepest respect for them. But uh, to even put that kind of pressure going forward on the teachers just adds one more thing. Uh, I'm gonna support what Dr. Ampey said, uh, safety of the kids is number one. Thank you. So um, I had a question for you. Um, I, don't, I don't actually know who to address it to, but it seems to be um, to, to move toward what Mr. Cardin is asking for of a sort of, um, a, a very collaborative approach. What we're hearing from the community is just sort of a lot of confusion, right? Which is understandable because, you know, here we are, I feel like we're, I'm, I'm reliving August to some extent in like a four grade situation, right? Because we're back here with a situation where we're hearing for families in remote academy, concerned about reallocation of resources away from their kids, right? So they're worried and we're hearing from people who want their kids to be in person and they're worried because they don't know what that's gonna look like. And so, um, you know, I think what we're what we're struggling with is you know all of these uh, there there are all these people who didn't know what simulcast was like three weeks ago right and now like all these emails talk about simulcast um so i so there were a couple of things that i just i sort of wanted to level set if we could at this point so this idea that we could somehow use town hall and churches and other buildings to schedule classes um is this something that we've looked into? Um, 
you know, I, I've, I've tried to sort of respond to people. I think it's reasonable to say, I, I, you can just nod with me, Dr. Janger, maybe that sort of citing modular classrooms on the AHS site at this point in the middle of a, of a construction project is, is probably not reasonable. Right, but if you could speak I think to Dr. Brody, actually has a great okay. answer for this one, if I recall. Right, I if somebody could just speak to so that we have some sort of like statement about using alternate spaces, um, and you know what has been considered, and um, why we're not doing that. I feel like that would be helpful. So, so I mean, the simple version is to make the schedule that Dr. that 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 um, that. Bill was talking about, we really need 10 or 12 full size spaces. 10 or 12 modulars um, is $250,000 a piece. It's $3 million if you could find one and get one delivered. And Dr. Bodhi can speak to that. I know that Dr. Bodhi looked around at spaces, churches, and everything around to find additional spaces. But again, I would need 10 of those within a few minutes of the high school in order for kids to be able to meaningfully move back and forth and run courses. There was some discussion and I looked into this idea of sort of finding larger spaces to do more things. But once we had our large spaces open, we really had enough of those to have flexibility. I don't know, Kathy, did you wanna to speak to that? Cause I remember you were talking about doing that homework. I can, first of all, town hall is being used by Park and Rec for a, uh, a program. Uh, to support families in town. I have looked at I have looked at at churches. And first of all, in churches, the spaces are very small. And I've looked at um, you know possible commercial spaces. And I, and I actually looked quite a lot in, in not for this year, but in past. And the thing is about commercial spaces, you have still have to meet certain requirements. Uh, uh, code requirements that can be very expensive in terms of ADA. So it is not a just go find a space in town and we can put a class there. It, it really doesn't work like that. Um, I suppose that some churches, if they, we, you could use the big space, the actual um, um, place of worship or the gymnasium, that might be one possible space. But the usual, the CCD rooms that they would have are actually fairly small and would only have a few, uh, would have very limited number of students that could be in there. But the bottom line is that when we've reached out to do that, those spaces are not available. So uh, it's important, and I'm glad you brought this up because uh, I have heard the same thing. Why don't you find this, do this, do this? And I can tell you that we have looked into these spaces. And uh, they're, they're just not viable uh, um, options. Thank you. So I think, you know, if, if reading uh, my email over the last three, you know, couple of days is, is, is an indication, uh, Dr. Janger, we, you know, I think parents are eager for information. I think they're trying to distill things. I see we have um, a number of people on the call tonight, which is good. I do feel like we're in a, in a situation where we're, um, we're using meetings to sort of re- iterate things. And I'll be honest, I, I, I'm the first to admit I needed the second explanation tonight to actually be able to participate. I went to the CIA meeting. I listened to it the first time I needed to come here tonight after looking at the slides again so that I could actually like participate um, in the thought process. But, um, you know, I it sounds like you're going to provide some videos for people. Um, and I think that that's great because I think to the extent possible, we do want to to move forward um, on on all you know on on figuring these out and um and not continue to sort of restart every time right um but we definitely needed it tonight so i'm grateful for that um but it would be great if there was a resource that you could share with us too that we could point people to when they reach out um with questions that um, maybe already have been answered so um dr allison ampey i guess the other thing is what do you recommend we tell people when they say, I'm happy with the current option, I don't know how to answer the survey? So I think if they're happy with the current option, 
I would assume that they would be happy with the departmental shift, that the departmental shift is this, the current option with a more robust, systematic, and easily implemented version of reverse field trips. So the reverse field trips are replaced with an every 10 day programmed visit, which I think will make that easier on everybody. But the thing that people generally like about the other one is this sort of regular 80 minutes. And if they don't like the reverse field trips, they should do the departmental shift and opt to be remote. Okay, so that, that's what we tell them is, is if you like the current model, you vote for departmental shift and then you decide whether the in-person class time works for your family or not. Right, okay. All right, any more comments on this? So where we're moving, Dr. Jenger is a CIA meeting on the third, is that correct, um, Mr. Cardin? Yes, it is, yeah. Okay, all right, so that's our next, our next. Right, and because I wanna be respectful of the comment uh, that, that uh, Dr. Schlickman said before about getting things in advance, the survey closes on the 30th. As soon as we have the dashboard available, I will share that with the committee. Um, I have a consultant lined up and ready to go, so hopefully it won't be very fast, but I'm not sure how long it will take. So I hope that you're not getting sort of it, it on the morning of the third. Um, but if it is, I apologize in advance because um, we're going to do it as quickly as possible. And I'm, I'm trying to, I am pre-gaming it in terms of, you know, guessing at my analysis. So hopefully I can, I will be prepared to talk that through. Great. All right, anybody else on this item? Super. Um, so the next item on our agenda is a discussion about the superintendent search in candidates. Um, for those listening tonight at home, most of you know by now that uh, in June of 2019, Dr. Bodie notified the committee that it was her intention to retire at the end of this school year. Um, we have benefited tremendously from stability and leadership over the last 13 years with Dr. Bodhi at the head, um, and I'm looking forward to being able to fully and collectively express our collective gratitude for her work and stewardship, and I am confident that she will approach uh, transition and leadership with her characteristic commitment to collaboration and loyalty that has served us well in Arlington for over a decade. So after Dr. Bodie's announcement, a search process committee was formed, chaired by Mr. Schlickman, and that subcommittee evolved into a search screening committee that included teachers, administrators, parents, students, and members of the community, as well as three members of the school committee. That screening committee brought us two finalist candidates for the position of superintendent in early November. Last week and this week, the candidates have had an opportunity to meet with stakeholders in our community here in Arlington all via Zoom. Uh, members received stakeholder feedback through a feedback form. Many of us were contacted directly. We have also had the opportunity to connect with references, both provided and sought out. We've benefited from the support of our search consultant, Mr. Kucher. Um, and I can say that I have not spent as much time on the phone in the last 10 days uh, since I was like 13 and my parents cut off my phone time at nine o'clock. Um, so I want to share a little bit how I'd like to structure this conversation tonight on this item. When we met 12 days ago, we decided that we were not going to commit to making a decision tonight necessarily, but we left that option open. In framing the decisions that we need to make, I think it's critical we remember that we are not answering of a, a question of are we choosing Dr. Greer or Dr. Homan as our next superintendent, we're mostly, we are, we are, we are really fundamentally asking ourselves, are we, are we seeking to hire Dr. Greer? Are we seeking to hire Dr. Homan? They're separate questions. Um, we could also elect to engage in a new search. So the way I see it tonight, we have five choices. We can select Dr. Greer to pursue as our superintendent. We can select Dr. Homan to pursue as our superintendent we can decide we need to obtain additional information, we can decide we need to search for additional candidates, and we can not come to any decision and we can schedule our next meeting. So I, I couldn't find any more choices than that. So I came up with five. 
Um, so what I'd like to ask the committee to do in our usual order is to speak to where you are at in your decision making process. Um, each member will indicate if they have a candidate they favor, if so, whom and why, if they like both equally or neither, if they feel they need further information to make a decision. I think it's important to note to the community that in my mind anyway, this isn't a zero sum game. A positive statement about one candidate does not mean the opposite is true of another. If I speak positively about the communication style of one, it does not mean necessarily that I'm of the opinion that the other candidate does not possess that skill at all. It is my belief that the screening committee gave us the two strongest and most viable candidates. I have great trust in this process and in the people leading and participating in it. Both candidates we received are impressive and very skilled. So after each member has a chance to speak, we can do a second round where members can share their thoughts on why they favor one over another or respond to other comments. Um, and then at that time, we can see where the will of the committee lies and I can entertain motions um, if anybody would like to do so. Um, I will share with our audience that this is due to the nature of public meetings and open meeting laws. This is the first time this committee has come together to deliberate after the whole committee has had a chance to meet with both candidates. So we are here tonight um, to, to, you know, to start having that conversation. So um, I'm gonna start by calling on Ms. Exon. Thank you. Um, at this point, I think I have enough information and I have a candidate that I prefer. Um, I think that we should pursue Dr. Elizabeth Holman as our next superintendent. We were fortunate to have two strong candidates as finalists for this position. We are lucky that our town was able to attract such strong candidates and we have had a very involved um, community in the search process. I believe that Dr. Holman is the right person for this job because she is a strategic planner who will set a clear vision for Arlington schools and inspire others to achieve the vision. She is an effective collaborator who works with educators and families to affect change. Reference after reference shared examples of how she responds to the needs of classroom teachers, parents, students, and administrators. She's both humble and reflective. In every interview, she shared experiences that went well by giving credit to her team and took more independent responsibility for the challenges. She places equity and inclusion at the center of her work, placing high expectations on all students and recognizing that all students can be engaged to achieve more. Um, based on the choices before us, I believe that she is the right person to lead the Arlington Public Schools and I am happy to support her. So that is where I am right now and I look forward to hearing the thoughts and perspectives of my fellow, fellow committee members. Uh, Mr. Cardin. Thank you. Um, so I am also ready to, to uh, state my, my favorite candidate. I think had we not been in you know, quarantine, um, had there been different circumstances um, you know, with the candidates in their, their current districts, um, you know, I would, would have preferred a more formal site visit like has been done in the past by other districts, but uh, we've all had a lot of conversations and um, uh, to the extent we could, um, and that has sort of, it, we'll have to substitute for, for, for what we can't do right now. Um, you know, an unintended consequences, an unintended consequence that in my mind of having only two finalists is that there is a sharper focus on the contrast between these two candidates. Um, but I agree with Ms. Morgan that we should try to focus on the positives of the candidate that we, we think we would like to select. They're both excellent candidates. Uh, it seems likely that the person who does not get our, our position will become a superintendent elsewhere very soon. Uh, and we're very fortunate uh, to have them. And I thank them both for, for the, their participation in the process, which is very difficult over Zoom uh, and very rigorous. Uh, with that background, I'm excited about the possibility of having Dr. Holman become our superintendent. In my mind, she emerged as a strong contender with her detailed application, where she presented three detailed examples of her leadership in Waltham that are highly relevant to Arlington. These demonstrated her deep experience despite her short tenure in her position. 
I was also greatly impressed by the recommendation from George Frost and Waltham, one of the three acting superintendents or, or, or actual superintendents that Dr. Homan worked with there, who specifically detailed why Dr. Homan should be our superintendent despite not being a traditional choice. He suggested focusing on the characteristics of, sec of successful superintendents and noted how Dr. Homan excelled in each of the five areas he identified. In her interview with the screening committee and in the following inter interviews, she impressively answered the questions with a great deal of detail and thought. I'll let the words of others express the thoughts that I and many others uh, had following those interviews. As a parent noted, as an educator myself, I was truly impressed by Dr. Homan's responses in the public interview. I have been a part of many other interviews for district leadership positions, and I have never been so impressed by the answers I heard. An APS administrator noted she entered the questions with solid examples and painted a picture for us of what she can do and her vision moving forward. At a more detailed level, another APS administrator noted that she articulated the kind of structure needed to create change, active engagement of all stakeholders, sharing data with the community to make informed decisions that may not be popular at first, but are educationally sound. This is strongly backed up by those who have worked with Dr. Homan, such as one Arlington parent who wrote, Dr. Homan is brilliant. She listens to staff and parents, find problems to solutions, and knows how to get things accomplished. Many APS administrators and teachers reacted favorably as well, noting that she was impressive across multiple rounds of interviews and has the skill set needed for the next few years. I understand the concerns that some, that some have expressed about Dr. Homan's limited experience. But I would point out that our town manager had a, a similar number of years as an assistant when he made a very successful transition to our town manager. I'm confident that Dr. Homan would do the same. As one APS administrator noted, she would, rely on this, she would rely on the strong professional team we have here in Arlington to support her growth as superintendent. Dr. Homan will bring a strong vision built around a focus on equity, along with empathetic and smart leadership. She's the kind of leader I want for Arlington schools. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Allison Ippy. Thank you. Um, first, I do think both of our candidates, um, especially given the difficulties over Zoom and undertaking a cert, uh, undertaking an application in these unusual and restricted conditions. Um, and you're going to find out in as I read that there's some duplicates and this is what happens when you don't have a chance to discuss beforehand what you're gonna say. Um, I too am ready to make a choice at this time or make a decision. I too am in favor of choosing Dr. Elizabeth Homan. I was impressed with Dr. Homan's knowledge, specificity and reflectiveness. She has a data-based approach that also acknowledges the softer areas of empathy and emotions and lived experience. I appreciate her idea of developing a strategic plan, something we've needed for quite a while. I feel she has the ability to move the district forward from the place that we, where we are now, which is a much better place than we were 10 years ago, and that she would be able to connect to administration, educators, students, and families as she did it. I feel she would hear concerns, seek out answers, and then work to implement them. I also feel she will be able to quickly come up to speed in areas where which are less familiar to her, such as town meeting, and that helping her do this is part of our task as school committee. And I hope that we all, should she, should whoever become superintendent, that we all help them do this. Um, and I thought I would read a few highlights from the surveys, which I'm gonna have to skip the ones that Mr. Cardin's already read. Um, from students, we heard she's very, I think she's very committed to the important social justice work that Arlington is doing, and I appreciate her answering questions directly and meeting them head on with a plan. She was also very friendly. She's definitely aware of current issues and justices surrounding race, racism, equity, diversity, inclusion, and gender identity. She's open to our ideas and will make sure to listen to our opinions. She has a great ability to connect, communicate, and interact with students. She seems very interested in using student feedback and taking ser students seriously. From teachers, we heard that she answers questions succinctly, professionally, insightfully, and thoroughly. Truly listened and took advantage of opportunities to connect. She was a forward thinker, planful as opposed to reactive. She had clear, very clear answers and positive visions for everything she was asked about. She helped 
developed some amazing programs in Waltham and that we would be lucky to get her. One teacher wrote, my initial concern was that it was doctor's short experience as assistant superintendent. After listening, I was impressed with her breadth and knowledge as a district administrator. Our administrators found her, uh, doc Dr. Holman was impressive across multiple rounds of interviews and presented stronger and stronger each successive interview. She was able to answer questions on all topics with intelligence, knowledge, and examples. She was honest and reflective about what she has learned and where she has to grow. She did not have to be pushed to provide examples of what she might different, do differently. She provided this up front and didn't hesitate to own areas of growth. Um, and then parents wrote, she's thoughtful about the good use of quantitative data in combination with qualitative data. They liked her 50 year plan and thought it was sincere and thoughtful. They liked the idea that she presented yesterday as of equity as a North Star. She's shown legitimate and documented prioritization of hiring educators of color and has a strategy for it. She also liked what she, the parent also liked what she had said about barriers to parent engagement and how she's worked on them. Um, another parent wrote that she's extremely intelligent, articulate and confident. She has a very developed idea about equity and inclusion. She seems very strong in her thinking about curriculum development and her involvement in the school high school building project and capital planning is of great value. And finally, from town officials in our community, they've said she's extremely articulate and thorough, extremely articulate and thorough answers to complex questions, provided context with each answer, showed huma humanity and compassion, demonstrated intellectual humility and impressive depth of knowledge on contemporary issues and education and society. I was, and someone writes, I was particularly impressed by her comments on how she likes to engage with the community directly. I think this would be of particular value in Arlington. I'm pleased to support her um, at, to pursue as superintendent. Mr. Thielman. Thank you. Um, you know, first I wanna thank uh, Mr. Slickman, Dr. Allison Ampey, Mr. Cardin uh, for the hours they put in on the superintendent search process. Uh, and I think they did a terrific job and made our jobs a lot easier. We had a goal of getting a superintendent by December of 2020 uh, so that we would have enough time for a transition. And so we would be ahead of the curve in the, in the rest of the state. And uh, I think we're on our way to do that. I also wanna thank the 15 person screening committee which um, met for many hours and uh, sent us two candidates that they unanimously supported. Um, and I wanna thank Glenn Kucher and the Massachusetts Association of School Committees for guiding us through this process and Jane Morgan for leading us um, and uh, encouraging us a few weeks ago to do our don't own due diligence on each of the candidates, call the references and learn what we can about them. So uh, tonight, <clears throat> um, I wanna urge my colleagues to join me in supporting the selection of Dr. Elizabeth Holman to be the next superintendent of Arlington's public schools. Uh, in my hiring uh, at in both locally and professionally, I consider multiple factors, including demonstrated knowledge, experience, and exposure to all aspects of the posted position, the candidate's worldview, perspective, and life experiences, and the candidate's potential to excel at this moment in time in the job at hand. With that in mind, I carefully listened to the interviews of the candidates, watched their screening community interviews, and spoke to several individuals who know them and have worked with them, both people on their reference list and others. Um, <clears throat> I am choosing Dr. Holman because she has a demonstrated ability to connect with and work collaboratively with principals, department heads, teachers, union leadership, parents, and other stakeholders to get things done. I spoke with eight different individuals in Waltham, including her current supervisor, Dr. Regan, the superintendent, uh, two members of the school committee, two principals, and three teachers. They universally praised her for designing and leading an inclusive and transparent process that engaged a committee of 85 people, including parents, students, teachers, administrators, 
school committee members and other stakeholders in planning how to open Waltham schools this fall. Community members and those involved in the planning meetings felt good about the solutions they developed together for their community. The people I spoke with, and I think we saw this in the interview, praised Dr. Homan's attention to detail, her organizational skills, her follow through, and the research she did, she did to prepare and does to prepare for all of her work. Everyone I talked to confirmed, I think, what we saw in Liz Holman in our interviews. She digs deeply into data, listens to parents, students, and teachers, and finds challenges to the daily challenges of running a school district. Waltham has a high percentage of English language learners, people of color, and immigrant families. Dr. Holman has paid particular attention to diversity, equity, and inclusion in her role as superintendent, and she reflected on that in her own personal growth. Uh, <clears throat> over the past three years, working under three superintendents, as has been alluded earlier, she, according to many, many people, was the go-to person for many teachers, principals, and other administrators. I <clears throat> find it reassuring that Dr. Holman um, <clears throat> Uh, has experience with and grew up with much more diversity, I think, and adversity uh, than many of us. She told us about uh, reading books by authors of color in high school and that those books changed her worldview. She shared with us that she was raised by a single mother, worked her way through school, and understood that the way to a better life is through education, equal education, accessible to every learner, regardless of background. Everyone confirmed that I spoke with confirmed what Dr. Homan told us. She does her homework and you have to do years to keep up with her. She connects very well with principals and department heads and has learned to study data, listen to stakeholders, work with faculty and staff and make change. She has detailed experience of uh, educational technology and she knows curriculum and pedagogy. As someone who has worked with three different superintendents in Waltham, according to many people, she has learned how to lead, she has observed different leadership styles at the, at the superintendent level, and she is developing her own unique style. Not only did I appreciate the substance of her answers, which were very detailed, I found her responses in our interviews ref refreshingly honest. Dr. Homan identified her areas of growth, and they were identical to what people in Waltham said, both those on a reference list and those not on our list. She admitted she had never been a building principal and has to take a step back to hear what her building principal needs and experiences before diving into a solution. Her, her references and non-references said the same. She has dealt with a few human resources issues, not as many as an experienced superintendent, but like anyone new to senior leadership, she freely admits that she has a lot to learn about human resources, and I think that's a good thing. <clears throat> um, we have a lot of talent in our district now, talented principals, talented teachers, talented people picked by Dr. Bodhi, who will and can collaborate with Dr. Homan to make our district even better. Some things have been said about her knowledge of municipal government. My take from talking to many people and from observing her in action is that she'll learn municipal government. And just as her, as her colleagues have learned in Waltham, Liz Holman will do her homework, she'll come prepared, and those who are engaged with her on municipal issues in the not too distant future will need to come prepared as well. Dr. Holman <clears throat> uh, has studied our schools and our community and it's clear she wants to be in Arlington. She wants the very best for our students. She has the experience, the drive, the intellect to join our school system, connect with our school leaders and take it uh, to the next level that beyond the level that was developed by Dr. Bodhi and her team excellently over the past 13 years. We have an opportunity to hire a rare talent who will leave impact on education in our community and maybe one day in a broader community. I'm excited to support her, her candidacy and uh, later in the meeting, hopefully to support a motion to direct the chair to enter into negotiations with Dr. Elizabeth Holman to be the next superintendent of the Arlington Public Schools. Mr. Schiffman. Thank you. Uh, I want to reflect back to the uh, mission statement that was brought before us as the search committee went to search for a superintendent. We had a very, a, uh, very detailed and instructive uh, report from the focus groups. 
And there were a couple of unifying themes that were coming up. One, experienced as a teacher and educator, there was broad consensus that the next Arlington superintendent should have experience in the classroom or directly with students, such as a counselor, therapist, or specialist, and they urged the school committee to avoid non-traditional candidates. The candidate in the search who aligns to that criteria is Dr. Greer. Dr. Greer has extensive experience both as a teacher and as an administrator. Another thing that we came out of the, oh, I, I want to mention that the reason why this came out so strong and so consistently in our discussions in the focus groups was the experience that we had back in 2004 when we hired a non-traditional superintendent who had some public governance experience as a member of, a, of the Boxford School Committee and had a couple of years of unpaid experience as an assistant superintendent, but didn't have the depth of knowledge, understanding, and experience that, it, that a place like Arlington requires. This is not a community uh, to put on training wheels and be a training ground for somebody who does not have the requisite experience. And the focus groups cried out for this all through the summer. Responses and, and broad consensus to those participated in focus groups were clear that issues of special education need to be addressed as a highest priority for the next superintendent. Parents and community members were consistent and specific about what they believe are systemic and structural problems that have festered for a number of years. Again, that's from the focus group report. When Mr. Thielman took over as chair of this committee in 2004, he was faced with the worst coordinated program review in the history of the State Department of Education. They summoned him to Malden to give him the report in person in his hands because it was such a critical problem. We have improved from that point Culturally, there are still remnants of the days back in 2004 when we had issues in this district. As noted above and explained in detail, the superintendent will need to take on a significant improvement in special education services, including building a relationship with parents to work on concerns. This will occupy a considerable amount of time in a superintendent transition and will not be allowed to go unaddressed. Again, from the focus group report, only one candidate fits this bill and Dr. Greer has successfully renovated the program in Cambridge. Teachers and parents called for more training and cultural competency, as many examples were cited in both groups and direct discreetly of how students may feel excluded, disrespected, or ignored. Students believe their teachers are well-intended, but not always well-suited to understand minority students or children at social and economic risk. Several parents note the absence of role models for minority students, and there were frequent examples of inappropriate, however unintentional, remarks or actions that undermine the morale of these children. Again, the candidate who is best able to meet the demonstrated needs from the focus group report unquestionably is Dr. Greer. I would first like to propose that seeing that at this point it's obvious that the committee is not in unanimous agreement, that we have some work to do in order to bring us to a point where we might come closer to agreement and that I think that we could do some sort of site visits virtually in order to gather more information. And I think more information is called for. The people who participated in last night's meeting with Dr. Greer, the people who were 
uh, on the town side, the diversity groups, the FinCom, the Capital Planning Committee, were all very disappointed that the technical difficulties of the uh, of the video conference last night, and there was considerable request from them to be able to have another chance to ask conversations free of technical difficulties. I think that we owe that to them. And also, if we take a look at the responses that were coming in from the from the surveys and reactions that that group, even within the course of the technical difficulties, had a very positive image. Also, I think it's important for the community to brought, be brought on board uh, to understand and have a conversation with us about the choice we're able to make. Uh, the interview with Dr. Homan wasn't posted on ACMI until y late yesterday afternoon. So a lot of people who want to see it and comment on it and think about it have not had that opportunity. Our goal for finishing the search has been to complete it by December. We are on target with our search. We have time to think about it a little more. We have time to get more community feedback. We have time to do site visits. We have time to, uh, to align to a position where the misgivings about either candidate can be resolved. Uh, I was in conversation with a member of the Sharon School Committee, and she said this, that Bill Belichick did not do very well in Cleveland because he was in Cleveland. When he was removed from a source of dysfunction and brought to New England, he became the best coach in the history of the NFL. This is the choice we have here, ladies and gentlemen. We have Dr. Greer, who was in Sharon in a school committee that was utterly dysfunctional and openly racist. And I have members of the Sharon school committee or former members who will document in detail what has happened over there, who endorse her fully, who are cheering for us because they look upon us as the New England Patriots having the opportunity to get an all-star that they couldn't keep because of the dysfunction of their committee. I don't want us to be the New York Jets. I don't want us to pass the extraordinary superintendent because of the dysfunction of Sharon. This is an extraordinary candidate. This is a candidate who understands municipal finance, who understands public governance, who understands what needs to be done and matches the criteria we wrote in that focus group report to a T and then go back and read the references. There is no finer and more difficult reference to come by than Dr. Carla Bear, who's the former superintendent in Lowell and was a senior deputy commissioner of the Department of Elementary and ed Secondary Education. That reference alone is probably the most spectacular reference I've seen from either her or another person. We have an opportunity to hire a highly qualified candidate who has some controversy, but that's because she's been a superintendent who's encountered racism because, well, she's the candidate who's going to encounter racism. She is the stellar educator we need in this district. She will move us forward. We thought or actually many of the members of this committee, I was not one of them, thought we were going to move forward in 2004 when we picked the inexperienced alternative candidate and look where that got us. I think we're on the prep precipice right now of choosing an exceptional leader or, or going with somebody who is inexperienced and lacks the basic core knowledge of municipal finance and governance. And ladies and gentlemen, 
the core function of the superintendent is not to be an assistant superintendent. You can interview well on questions regarding how, what it is to be an assistant superintendent. The job is to be the facing front of this community, dealing with municipal finance, dealing with public governance, dealing with crisis issues, uh, having the experience in a complex, difficult district with a bunch of intelligent people who there's always a dozen people out there who know more than you do in this district and are willing to express that. One candidate I think is qualified, that's Dr. Greer. Thank you very much. Mr. Hainer. Tough act to follow. Deciding who I would support for superintendent was difficult. I believe each of the finalists would be a credit to the Arlington school system. Arlington is, unique, is in a unique situation in seeking a new superintendent. We are at the beginning of a multi-year construction program that requires experience, not on-the-job training. We are recovering from a pandemic with all the problems, emotional and educational, that will need an innovative leader who will make tough decisions in the best interest of all the children of Arlington, especially those who have special needs. I believe Dr. Greer is the best choice for the following reasons. She has been recently involved uh, in a school district constructing a brand new high school. Dr. Greer knows how to deal with the oversight and all the issues in a project of this nature. She knows how to deal with the reports out of the state. It's not a learning time for her. Dr. Greer's background in special education will only strengthen our existing programs and provide for whatever adaptations that this community will need as these students come back full time. Dr. Greer has daily experience in running an entire school district, both the educational and physical components. Any person who comes to this, into the system will have a learning curve. Dr. Greer's learning curve will be learning about Arlington. She will hit the ground running on day one. For these and many other reasons, I will support Dr. Greer for the position of superintendent. Thank you. Right. So uh, for me, I, uh, I also support Dr. Elizabeth Homan as our next superintendent. I believe her communication style is direct and specific. And when I listen to her talk, I understand what she's trying to tell me. She demonstrated self-awareness during multiple rounds of meetings. Her humility around and obvious pride in accomplishments that were achieved when she was leading a team came up repeatedly. Her facility with discussing, discussing issues around diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as her work with curriculum development and implementation will be significant assets and will contribute to making progress on our district goals. What she may lack in direct superintendent experience, she makes up for in potential. Her collaborative data-driven leadership style was mentioned repeatedly by people familiar with her work. I believe that she will be able to communicate to us a vision for Arlington that is developed to leverage the considerable strengths of our existing administration, faculty and staff and move us forward. I ran for election to the school committee to be a part of making this decision when the time was right and the time is now. When I asked myself the question of whether or not we should pursue Dr. Holman as our next superintendent, my answer is yes. So, um, I appreciate the, uh, the work of the committee in, in going through this. It is very challenging to do this work uh, in public. Um, and, uh, but I think that, um, but, I, but I'm grateful for people um, sharing their thoughts and sharing where they are. So I do want to offer members who so choose um, an option to uh, provide additional comments or responses. Um, so um, Ms. Exton, do you have anything to add? It's not required. <laughs> not at this time. Mr. Cardin. Uh, thank you. So in the, in the, um, uh, flyer or whatever, the document we put out searching for the superintendent, there were seven items that we, we highlighted um, uh, as requiring for the, as wanting in our new superintendent. Uh, and uh, for me, um, 
you know, uh, across the board with, with one exception, uh, Dr. Homan was the stronger candidate. So I'll just run through them quickly. Number one, relate their teaching experience to, the, to their work as a leader, building a foundation of support of Arlington's professional staff. Now they both have teaching experience, which was not true of, I believe of the prior superintendent that Mr. Schlickman referred to. Uh, so that's uh, certainly both meet the requirement, but clearly Dr. Greer has more time in the classroom uh, and, and, and probably uh, uh, is the stronger candidate there. Build on the strengths of Arlington Public Schools and support members of the school committee in the work of continuous improvement. Build Arlington special education and English learner programs to become programs recognized for its excellence. Build a commitment to social justice to lead an anti-racist culture and curriculum, as well as create a climate and strategies conducive of recurring, of recruiting and retaining a diverse staff. Articulate a vision for the direction of Arlington Public Schools and build community support for that vision effectively communicate through various platforms with the district stakeholders, engage in the governing partnership with the Arlington School Committee. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Alice Nampi. Thanks, I have two things. For, the first one is one I forgot to say earlier. So I should have mentioned this before, this morning I received an email from one of our curriculum directors giving his opinion on the two candidates. I forwarded this email without additional commentary in an effort to provide my, com my colleagues with the information in a timely manner. In retrospect, I probably should have forwarded, it, sent it to Mr. Kutcher to forward on. Um, but I wanted to be sure that you all got it in time and I didn't receive any others that I didn't forward. Um, in terms of responding, uh, when I thought about, I felt it important to be able to discuss my decision. But when I thought about how to do this, I realized I didn't want to get to, into discussing any perceived negatives about the candidate I didn't favor um, because they are both strong candidates. And I just think it's wrong if you're not going to hire someone to be going into a whole bunch of stuff. But I also know that our committee's decision will be scrutinized through many different lenses. During our public interviews with the candidates, I tried to tackle the really difficult topics in the best way I could. And that's what I'm trying to do here again tonight. So I wanna say publicly that as I made my decision, I did take into account our special education needs. I did take into account our desire to increase diversity and representation in our staff. I did not disregard Dr. Greer on the basis of her lawsuit, which alleges racial discrimination in ways that I as a white person cannot fully fathom. Um, I also did the best job I could to examine my own internal biases and work to, to allow adjustments for them. But I also looked at a lot of other information. After reviewing all of this information, at the end of the day, I felt Dr. Homan is my preferred candidate and that she is well equipped to address all the issues we face in the Arlington Public Schools. I'm comfortable casting my vote for her when we ever vote. Um, if we vote, in no ways do I mean to imply that my colleagues did not follow a similar thought process, but I can only represent my own thoughts. Thank you. Mr. Thielman. I, uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Morgan. I think Dr. Allison Ampey actually <clears throat> summarized a lot of the things that I've been thinking. Uh, <clears throat> I um, gave, uh, equal consideration to both candidates. Uh, both candidates uh, have many strengths. I think uh, I think Dr. Homan, as I said earlier, uh, uh, answered questions uh, more precisely with more substance, more detail, more depth. Um, <clears throat> I believe that um, uh, a thing that I was looking for was an ability to connect with the staff that we have in the district uh, and lead that staff. And uh, I found that in my reference checking. Um, I, um, you know, this candidate, uh, Dr. Homan has five years of experience in the central office in, uh, in Waltham. Um, uh, our, pre our previous superintendent prior to Dr. Bodie um, did the Broad Institute and was a non-traditional candidate. I think Dr. Homan is far from a non-traditional candidate. Um, she, uh, is uh, steeped 
in based on everything that I've, I've, I've uh, everything I've heard and everyone I've talked to, she's steeped in uh, the logistics and the details of how a central office works, uh, how a central office interfaces with principals and department heads, and she understands that well. And she also understands how change can take place and uh, the limitations on change without getting, uh, unless you get uh, super, uh, principals and department heads uh, to buy into what you want to do. So um, uh, <clears throat> I uh, admire both candidates. Um, I think both candidates have many, many wonderful attributes. I think uh, I'm very comfortable with the selection of Dr. Holman. And um, I don't think it's a good idea for this committee to drag this out. Um, I don't think it's good for the candidates, actually. Um, and I think tonight, um, if there are five people in favor, the smartest thing to do is to put a motion on the table directing the chair to enter negotiations with uh, Dr. Homan with, with advice from our council. And then we can vote on that as a way to determine whether to take another step. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Schuchman. I would remind uh, Mr. Thielman that we had five votes for Mr. Levinson, uh, and we did site visits for the two top candidates we had. Um, I would say that my concerns about Mr. Levinson were decreased somewhat through the site visits and the further research. Uh, they weren't completely eased. I thought that in many ways, Mr. Levinson exceeded my expectations. Uh, he did have a background through the Broad Institute uh, in the superintendency. And I think the strengths and weaknesses of that were that he understood a lot about how to run a school district, but that left him without the key knowledge of public governance in, in a critical town and his inability to both be forthright with the community and to build support within the community led to his downfall. Um, and, and we took much more time with that process. The community had much more of a chance to see the candidates. We had an interview with these two candidates on Thursday and Friday, and one of the interviews wasn't posted till last night. The community hasn't had a chance to digest. So the people who have had an opinion going in or a reason to boost a candidate have been the loudest in our feedback. And I've seen far too many people posting comments in the feedback here that were, well, I know my second cousin knows somebody who worked with this candidate and I love her or I hate her because of this the evidence that are firsthand directly from first people who have interacted with this candidate or these candidates are still in our minds limited. And in fact, because we were off doing our own individual reference checks, we've, there's no commonality in our experience in terms of looking at them. We are doing this too quickly. If this is the will of the committee, then it will be the will of the committee in December 10th and we can vote or 12th or whatever the next meeting is and we can vote it. But there are people who are just starting to pay attention to what we are doing, who haven't had a chance to see these interviews, who deserves a chance after hearing our discussion to come back at us as members of the public to vo voice their opinions on this decision because the ratings that we're seeing in the feedback loops are divergent. We need to bring the community together in this. We are not in a position to unify the committee if we don't have a unanimous vote out of the committee, if we don't have some element of consensus, and we don't have that right now. If, if there's a motion to support the hiring of Dr. Homan, I will vote against it. If there's an, uh, a notice to reconsider it for the purposes of unanimity, I will vote against it. I feel very strongly 
that if we go down that road, we're making the wrong decision. In advancing her to forward, I was looking at the fact that other people saw things in her that I didn't see with the hope that she would show them and that didn't happen. I'm very concerned about the path we can put ourselves on because we, while we may be confident in the good people we have in the district who are working for us today and are doing the works in, in curriculum and the principles, if we hire the wrong leader or they feel slighted in any way, we may have a group of vacancies that we will be needing to fill and we will become a less strong district as a result. We cannot afford to do this so quickly because it is not obvious that one candidate is superior to the other. We can argue about this back and forth between all of us for a while, and the community is going to be arguing it back and forth because there's no universal consensus in the community or on this committee that, oh, yeah, we have one candidate who is a superior candidate. We don't have that. I'll make a motion to take up the decision of hiring a superintendent at our next meeting and request the search process committee to set up uh, 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 virtual site visits with the two candidate for the two candidates. That's my motion. I'll second it only for the purpose of discussion. All right, Mr. Hainer, go ahead. Although you and I lost our uh, second round commentary options, but I, I, I you can combine I'll, them together. Thank you. Um, Ms. Through the chair, I would ask Mr. Schlickman that if this motion prevails, would he be open to a uh, reconsideration at that time for uh, a consensus vote. Mr. Schiffman? Uh, uh, I would be much more inclined if I'm able to go and look, we, we haven't even met the candidates in person. And so that- Ex Excuse me, Paul. Yeah, I'm, I'm, the, the answer is I'd be more inclined if we were to, to go for the next step and do, do some site visits, yes. Mr. Mr. Morgan, may, may I continue? Yep, please do. Uh, I supported the motion. I seconded the motion for the purpose of discussion. Um, I, it looks like I will not be on a prevailing side either tonight or, or going forward, but I also shared with the chair the idea of the importance of having uh, unanimity in supporting whomever becomes our superintendent. Um, I, I, I guess, I, Mr. Schlickman, I need a commitment from you that I'm willing to support it going forward. I don't know about the other five members, but I do feel so strongly about the idea of having unanimity going forward with who, whomever becomes our new superintendent. Thank you. All right, um, more discussion on the motion by Mr. Schlickman. Dr. Allison Ampey and then Mr. Carter. I appreciate that Mr. Schlickman is concerned. I do, I'm still thinking, but right now I'm tending towards not supporting a motion, not supporting his motion. Um, I am unclear what additional information I will under um, that I will uncover in a virtual site visit that will change my mind. I am also unclear how opening to additional community feedback is helpful. In fact, I see this as a divisive move because you're essentially trying to rile up the community to kind of vote for your candidate. And that does not feel good to me. 
Um, I note that when I look at the feedback forms right now, both candidates actually had exactly the same number of responses. So although there was a delay in posting Ms. Holman's or Dr. Holman, Holman's um, interview, it does not seem to have substantively altered how many people were able to provide feedback. Um, and I really, I don't think we're the ones who were elected to make this decision. That's what school committee does. We don't punt it to our community. We don't punt it asking them for more feedback. We are there. We have followed the, process, the best process that we could under these extraordinarily difficult circumstances that we could, that, that have, we've been under. And I appreciate that Mr. Schlickman has strongly held reasons why he does not favor a particular candidate, but I am disappointed with the way that he is going about trying to persuade or impose the rest of us to change our minds. I, it's not part of our norms. And I am concerned that if he had specific questions that could be answered, that would be one thing. But I haven't heard specific questions. In fact, what I'm hearing is kind of a poisoning of the well. And that also is not in alliance with our norms. So, you know, right now, I think I'm voting against this motion. I'm sorry, I've processed it while I'm talking to you. Um, I'm voting against this motion. I think it's the wrong step for us to take. I'm sorry that it is not, that we are not able to come to a point where I think we will be able to have unanimity. Um, but I also feel that what is, there's a difference between getting in a boat and going somewhere and getting to your destination and jumping into the water and just making it all muddy. And I think that's kind of what, we're, what we'd be doing if we do this motion. So, sorry, been talking a lot. Okay, I'm done. Mr. Cardin. I lost Mr. Cardin. Oh, let's wait. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Thielman. Can, can you hold just a second so that we can just see if he comes back just so that you don't have to repeat? He's gone, right? Okay. <laughs> Fell off the grid. All right, go ahead, Mr. Thielman. Do you want to wait until Mr. Cardin comes back or we just yeah, I kind of do yeah let's, let's give him just a minute yeah maybe text him and see if he's okay let me find out Ms. Morgan may I make an observation I'm going to check sure. the calendar district I just I just want to uh make a public observation that Mr. Thelman and Ms. Exton dressed just for this meeting tonight. I saw them earlier. Oh, Mr. Mr. Cardin will be back with us momentarily. You gave me away. But you're very observant, Mr. Hainer. Nothing got does by this, the fourth grade teacher. Does, does this mean they were not dressed for any preceding meetings? Let's oh. not open us up to too much here. 
three of us were in a relaxed mode for our subcommittee meeting. Your subcommittee meetings sound much more interesting than most of mine. All right, Mr. Thilman, he said to go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, so look, my friends, um, I, I'm, I'm not going to support Mr. Schlickman's motion. I have a deep respect for Mr. Schlickman and uh, his position. I also have deep respect for um, the desire to get unanimity, but I think <clears throat> we will get unanimity uh, over the coming months <clears throat> as the new superintendent and the superintendent to be uh, begins to meet us and work with us. I, <clears throat> I actually think if we keep this up, we could lose both candidates. So I would urge the committee to vote no, and I would urge the committee to support a motion after we address this motion to direct the chair to begin negotiations with Dr. Holman. Thank you. Mr. Cardin. Thank you, sorry about that. It was, this was such a riveting meeting that I didn't notice my battery was dying. So, um, so thank you. Uh, so I had expressed concern last meeting about coming into this meeting without any structure. And this is precisely the reason why I had those concerns. Um, because now, you know, I, I had asked if we were going to do site visits, let's figure out a way to organize them or come up with a plan for a plan. Um, but now it looks like we're, we're, we're wanting to delay because uh, one member's favored candidate is not the favored candidate of a majority. Um, so maybe that's not the intent. Maybe, uh, you know, even if there was a, a split decision on, on going the other way, um, there would still be a proposal for more process. But I think now that we have a split decision, um, it's, it's gonna be widely known. That's okay, that happens all the time in searches. Um, you know, I, I appreciate Mr. Hayner's uh, move for a symbolic unanimous vote, um, but we've already had our, our <laughs> uh, we've already spilled the tea as the kids say. So um, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, we are where we are. Um, uh, I'm, I'm open if other people want more information to, to getting more information. I was always uh, open to the idea of site visits, um, but I think that at this point, now that we have all expressed our opinions, um, there, as Dr. Allison Ampey said, there, there isn't anything I wanna know to make my decision. I can't imagine anything um, you know, short of some negative revelation on one of the candidates that I believe already would have come out um, through our background checks that we've done, um, there really isn't anything else that I think would change my decision. So uh, I, I find I'm gonna have a hard time supporting this as well. Ms. Exton. Um, so from the, earlier in the process, I was very much in favor of some kind of in-person um, meeting with the candidates because I do feel like it gives us um, or would give me, you know, a sense of the candidates at this point. Um, I'm not sure that something in person or a virtual site visit would give me um, enough new information for me to change my mind on um, my preferred candidate for superintendent. Um, and then I have to agree with um, some of the other members of the committee that I worry about what delaying uh, the decision would do uh, to, the, to the two finalists that we have right now. Um, and, and also to the, uh, yeah, the, the community conversations that could come from that. So um, I'm not going to be supporting this motion. Anybody else? Uh, Mr. Schickman. Thank you. I just want to point out that persuasion is an important part of being a part of a deliberative body. And to trying to be persuasive in discourse or debate within the context of this committee is not a violation of our norms. It's what we're supposed to be doing because we cannot deliberate outside this meeting. So if we can't be persuasive here, we can't be persuasive anywhere.
So I uh, have spent a lot of time thinking about this decision as I alluded in my earlier remarks. Um, when I decided to run for school committee, this was something that I imagined might come up at some point. And um, it was something I was very interested in participating in. It was something I was deeply reflective about uh, during I have been very appreciative for the for the process and the care that has been given. Um, and I've spent uh, a lot of time, frankly, personally, uh, turning over rocks over the last few weeks since we found out who the two finalists were. Um, and going back to the same rocks and turning them over again to see if there was something different underneath them um, and walking around and looking at them from a different perspective um, and uh, talking to myself about it in my kitchen all the time. Um, and I, you know, I really felt this weekend that um, I really landed on a decision. And um, it was a decision that was uh, challenging to come to. It was extraordinarily time consuming. Um, and I, I know enough about myself to know that, that when, I, when I find myself someplace and I feel that sense of, of decision that uh, I, I just, I don't, I don't, I don't move from that from that place. Um, so I, I feel comfortable with what I know right now. I didn't, I didn't know, you know, 10 days ago or 12 days ago um, what I would need. I had not seen either candidate, um, but uh, I, I, I really felt like I got what I needed, um, what, I've, what I've needed over the last two weeks. So um, I, uh, so for that reason, and because I, I question what I would learn in a virtual site visit, um, and because um, I'm looking forward to moving this process, you know, I, I'm looking forward to uh, moving to a time when uh, we can we can plan and figure out, you know, where we're going as a district. I um, I, I I don't support doing uh site visits um and i don't so um that so that's where i'm at so i don't intend to support a motion to do um to do site visits at this time so any more um discussion about um on the motion from mr shukman seconded by mr hainer any more discussion seeing none uh, Ms. exton no. Mr. Cardin? No. Dr. Allison Ampey? No. Mr. Thielman? No. Mr. Shookman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? No. Oh. And I am also no. Ms. Morgan? Yes, Mr. Thielman. I move to direct the chair to enter into negotiations with Dr. Elizabeth Holman to be the next superintendent of the Arlington Public Schools. Second. Discussion. Mr. Cardin. Thank you. So I, you know, I just want to say that I appreciate Mr. Stuckman's views about the candidates, Mr. Hainer's views, everybody's views. Um, you know, certainly we all had done our research, um, and and it's had uh, as Dr. as Ms. Morgan uh, stated had spent has spent many hours and 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 lots of time uh, viewing videos and 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 coming to a conclusion. And, and certainly the discussion about uh, who we prefer uh, is, is one we should have had and, and, and we did have, and it revealed that there were differences and that's fine. I don't think um, that's, uh, you know, uh, that's what happens in these, these searches. And, and it's awkward because we have to do this in public and we can't have a, a backroom conversation um, about the candidates uh, as you would in a normal employment search. So. It's an awkward situation. I appreciate everybody's views, um, um, but I think we're, we're ready to, to take a vote. Thank you. Mr. Hainer. 
Thank you, Mr. Cardin, for saying that. Um, in the spirit of going forward in a positive way, I will be voting to support the majority view. Mr. Schlickman? Uh, as I stated before, I can't support this motion. I would prefer tossing the search and doing a do-over uh, as opposed to this outcome. I think it is the wrong outcome for the community. Uh, I cannot support it. More discussion, Mr. Thielman, I see you. No? Uh, well, I would just like to say that, you know, look, um, this has been a spirited discussion. I think um, we'll go home tonight and reflect on it. Um, and I hope that we, I know our committee will come together and support the new superintendent. And I hope uh, and think that we should be excited about this moment and we should be excited about the talent that we can bring into this position. And uh, I am confident that all of us can work together to support the new superintendent. There's a, we, Dr. Bodie has seven months left and a lot of work to do. So uh, there's a lot of work ahead of us as a committee and as a community. And uh, I, I think this is an exciting moment um, for the community. And I think we have an excellent choice and I wanna commend everyone who worked on it and thank them for it. Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, I want to point out that the search committee brought forward these two candidates and unanimously, and we're very happy with both of them. And I am disappointed that my colleague now feels that because we have chosen one of the candidates, that it is a failed search. Um, I want to, I'm trying to represent the rest of the search committee. I can't it, it's everything we did was an executive session, so I can't speak to it, but just that there was good feelings in the search committee about both candidates and that they, um, that's all. Mr. Schickman? Uh Yeah, we can't violate the terms of the executive session of the search committee. We had 15 members and two alternates. We had a rating system where we ranked candidates. Two candidates came up top. We voted to advance those two. That vote to advance was unanimous. I did not offer any points or scoring for Dr. Homan in the preliminary round for much the same reasons that I'm talking about now. It was, it, I, other people saw things in her that frankly I didn't see. And I was hoping through this process that I'd see something more because we our questioning was uh, the, uh, and I, I'll talk about this in terms of the public questioning. The public questioning up to this point was all in terms of internal district and curriculum operations. There's a definite lack of any kind of questionings about issues of governance, uh, of public policy, about any much much of anything that involves the uh, front-facing part of district operations. And that I think is the most important part of the job, which is why as the chair of the committee and supporting the structure and process of the, of the, uh, of the search committee, we came together unanimously to advance two candidates. But I think that it was clear in my rankings then and in terms of what I observed from that point going forward, having lived with these two candidates for, a, for an extended period of time since the beginning of the process, I kept looking for, for, for what I saw were the gaps to be filled in her candidacy in terms of the public governance and the outwardly facing stuff of this district. And I never saw that. And it was extraordinarily disappointing when on the first page of our focus group report, we talked about how a 252 town meeting mem uh, member town meeting is the appropriating authority for the schools. And that Dr. Homan couldn't answer the question as to 
who's our appropriating authority. I was hoping to go for the depth in terms of public governance from experience, from caring about public governance and understanding how school districts operate as a political structure. That's what I was looking for. And I never got there. And that is such a critical part of the job. I no matter, I've worked in central office for 19 years. I've seen about five superintendents come and go. I've seen superintendents come and go from Arlington. I know where superintendents fail because they can't master the emergencies or the externals. And I don't care how well you are able to go and do things internally in the district and master curriculum. This is an outside political front facing job. That is a concern of mine. I think it's a legitimate concern. We haven't had this discussion on this legitimate concern that's facing us. And I know I'm trying to be persuasive again in a committee that isn't buying my persuasion, but I need you to understand that this is a very heartfelt viewpoint from somebody who's worked in education all his life and observed many superintendents that I'm not being arbitrary, but I can't support this. Mr. Cardin. Uh, so just one response on that. Um, uh, there, there is one uh, Waltham School Committee meeting where Dr. Homan was the only administrator present. Uh, the the, the uh, current superintendent was not available for some reason. Uh, and she deftly handled the somewhat bizarre questions from uh, the Waltham mayor who chairs the school committee in her own unique manner and some of the school committee members uh, who, um, you know, every school committee has their own personalities and, and, and they have a bunch there as well. Um, it, it was a, an amazing performance um, and, and I have no, no question that she can step into this role uh, and be the public facing uh, uh, governing relations person that we need. Thank you. All right, anybody else on this motion? Seeing none. So motion by Mr. Thielman, second by Ms. Exton. Uh, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Carden. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? No. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am also yes. So uh, I believe your motion, Mr. Thielman, directed me to. Uh, I, so what I will do is uh, begin uh, thinking about a contract for uh, Dr. Homan, and um, I will come back to the committee at some point to uh, soon to discuss the contents thereof so that we can um, begin those negotiations. Mr. Hainer. Just a thought, you might wanna connect with uh, Mr. Kuchner. He has got a little experience in this and may, may be able to help guide you. I have no doubt that he will. Hi, Mr. Kucher. One of the right. minor observation, it's after nine o'clock, so your record's shot. It is indeed, but I intend to end this meeting before I need to seek a motion to uh, extend it. So we all know when our time is up. All right, uh, that has, uh, we have reached the end of our agenda for tonight. Thank you all for being here. Um, and I am looking for a motion to adjourn. So move. Second. Uh, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am also yes. Have a good night. Thank you for your service. Happy holiday. Be safe. Thank you.